Coal miners in one community, they've been on strike now for months. Working as long as 12 hours a day, seven days a week, in some of the most dangerous conditions. I really think that the labor movement is the single greatest force for democracy in the history of the United States. The story of Alabama is a story of not just resilience, but of militancy. I say no contract, you say no. If we ain't all free, ain't none of us free. You're listening to Alabama's only union talk radio show, The Valley Labor Report, with Adam Keller and Jacob Morrison. Hello, Tennessee Valley. This is The Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison. My co-host and fellow agitator is Adam Keller, and we are broadcasting live online and on the radio from the heart of the Tennessee Valley, the Spice Radio Studio in North in Huntsville, Alabama. Today, Jonah Furman talks to us about the Labor Notes Convention. We talk about organizing the South with Virginia educator Patrick Corte and a cook, Sakia Royal, in North Carolina. Scott Herrick from Union League joins later in the program and more on today's Valley Labor Report. Uh, Folks, if you haven't gotten enough of us by the time that we wrap here on the radio, or if you just want to see what we're up to throughout the week, then you can find us online. We're anywhere you can find anything online. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, newly on TikTok, wherever you find your podcasts, all at The Valley Labor Report. Just a reminder, your support helps us stay on the air. Our largest single source of funding comes directly from our listeners. If you want to become a sustaining member of the program, make a one-time donation, or buy our new hat, you can go to our website, tvlr.fm, or become a patron at Patreon dot com slash the valley labor report and if you're a member of a union you should get your local to sponsor the show reach out to me for more details on that we would greatly appreciate it so folks um we're not here right now we're actually this is crazy crazy stuff we're doing time travel crazy stuff we are not here we're in chicago we're in Chicago, Illinois, for the Labor Notes Convention. Really, really excited about it. And uh, so we have pre-taped today's program on uh, uh, earlier in the week. And uh, so we figured it would be fitting to kick off our show that we pre-taped because we're going to be at Labor Notes. We figured it would be fitting to kick it off by talking about labor notes, by talking about the convention. And so our first interview today is with Jonah Furman, a staff writer at Labor Notes and a uh, uh, person who is doing a lot of work to put together this convention. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Play that interview with Jonah Furman. So I've got with me Jonah Furman. Jonah Furman is a staff writer for Labor Notes, and he is currently busy as a bee putting together a convention for Labor Notes to which 4,000 union members and workers, labor activists across the country are going to be attending in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Jonah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I I know that you're really busy, so I I really do appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Absolutely. Adam and I are are extremely excited as well. I have been uh, preparing all day, um, mostly by washing my car that I have not washed in years since um, (laughs) we're going to be having a caravan up there and I'm the one driving. So I figured I should like clear out the trash and everything. (laughs) But uh, a good organizer's car is always messy. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's not even necessarily because I'm doing organizing stuff it's just that i eat a lot of fast food and uh i just throw the bags in the floorboards so So, uh jonah 
talk the talk to us first about I guess before we get into the convention. Give me just a, just an elevator pitch. Labor notes. What is labor notes? Sure. Yeah, labor notes is a we call it a media and organizing project. It's been around since 1979, and it's basically half journalism about the labor movement from the bottom up, from the perspective of members, especially members who are pushing their unions in a direction of more strikes, more inclusion, more union democracy, challenging the status quo. And then the other half is the organizing side, which is trainings and connecting people, building networks, member to member networks in the labor movement that can, you know, create organization that can push the labor movement to do more, to be more democratic, to be more militant, and to connect member to member, shop steward to shop steward, local president to local president, connect people across unions, across industries. So those are the two big things we do, and we've been doing it for 45 years and have, you know, managed to create something like a different pole in the labor movement, right? So something that's pushing against the status quo and putting forward a different vision of how our unions can operate. I, I And I think y'all do an excellent job at that. Uh, I think looking back at, say, the John Deere strike in a similar way that Kim Kelly has kind of become the national face of or, or a, a national voice on the mine worker strike, I think that, that you in particular, and, and, and then by extension Labor Notes, uh, were kind of a national voice for the John Deere strike. And I think that was very important. And, and, and y'all did a lot of good stuff there. Um, a lot of good reporting on... On issues with the carpenters up in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, just any any you know kind of really important labor issue. Y'all are generally speaking on top of it and and doing the reporting and storytelling in a way that that not a lot of people are, which is to talk to the workers and kind of see what they have to say. Uh, so <laughs> that's that, that's a really yeah good. totally. I mean, I think those are those are two good examples of sort of what makes labor notes different. Is we'll tell we'll help people tell their stories. And we'll listen to the rank and file members and see what they have to say. But then we'll bring them in if they want to get connected with other workers or they're going through a situation they're trying to figure out. You know, John Deere was a situation where you had members voting down the contract over and over. So they weren't going to the union for how can I vote down my contract better? How can I organize for this? So now at our Labor Notes conference, for example, we have Seattle Carpenters and John Deere strikers who are coming out to keep deepening not just their storytelling and their reporting, but deep in their organizing skills and connections with workers uh, across industries, usually, again, who are challenging their unions to be better, be more militant, be more inclusive, be more democratic. Why is it important? And, and then and then we'll have a good segue into the convention. Why is it important that unions be more militant and democratic? Why is that something that working people that are listening on the radio right now um, that are in unions or not in unions? Why would it be that I would want the labor movement to be more militant and democratic? Well, obviously, you know, for even people not in unions, stronger unions have important social benefits, right? So you see, like, stronger unions with more members of unions in society as a whole means less income inequality. It means bigger social safety net means, you know, just in general, it trends towards things that help people, even if they're not in a union. So, you know, why would you need to push on the unions to do more is because, in the U.S., as people probably know, the union movement has been in decline or stagnation for at least 40 years, you know. Uh, so the status quo in the union movement, just like we see in politics, just like we see in a lot of parts of our lives, the status quo has been falling apart for unions, for most unions, for many decades. And what it's going to take to turn things around is, in part, those members of those unions demanding more, pushing their unions to change course, organize more, strike more, specifically militancy. You know, we can't have a union movement that's just playing defense. You have to be not scared to fight for what's right, fight for what you deserve, to strike when it comes down to it, to, um, you know, to organize new shops and not just defend a shrinking shrinking slice of the pie. So that's that's sort of the big picture context is we've had a union movement in this country that has played defense and not played great defense for 
many decades. Not not every union, not every industry, but that's the the broad trend. And mm-hmm. we support people who are trying to turn that around by challenging the unions to do more than they're currently doing. Because you know, and we think the knock on effects of that, you know, are are important for all workers, even if you're not in a union. And so this convention, what is it doing to, uh, you know, what is its general purpose as a convention and, and, and how is it going to be furthering those goals? Yeah, so, I mean, the overview is we, we gather every two years. This is the, Actually, this one is the first one in four years because of the pandemic. We had to cancel in 2020. But we gather every two years. And, for example, this time around, we have 4,000 attendees who will be from unions of every industry of from every state, several countries will be represented, uh, and they'll have over 250 sessions and workshops and meetups that are everything from training on how to bargain a union contract to meetups across the auto industry to uh, panels about, you know, we have panels on how the John Deere strike went, how the Starbucks workers are organizing. So a lot of it is just about connecting the people who are looking for a better labor movement, helping them find each other, talk to each other, and learn from one another. A big thing we believe is, you know, people learn from, you don't look up for guidance. You look side to side. You look to your fellow members. And a lot of what we do is just put people in a room where they can get some of the skills and have some of the conversations that they're looking for as they push for a stronger labor movement. Mm -hmm. And, and, I would looking at you can find the conference agenda on their website now labornotes.org or dot .com dot .org dot .org labor not, labornotes.org and just from some uh, some of the panels that I have knowledge of now uh, not having set my own personal itinerary yet I'm facilitating a panel on organizing the south who is it that labor notes has pulled together uh, for me to facilitate a com- conversation between it's not between it's not between uh, the international president of you know a million workers who's been off the shop floor potentially his whole career uh, or her whole career or has been off the floor for a really long time, even though, you know, there, there's there's certainly something to be said for talking to, to international presidents. But who is it that I'm speaking to? I'm speaking to a Amazon worker, an Amazon worker in Alabama, an Amazon worker in North Carolina, both of whom have been involved in the organizing campaigns. I'm speaking to a municipal employee in North Carolina, member of UE Local 150, and I'm speaking to a Virginia teacher, a uh, member of the Virginia Education Association about organizing the South. There are there's a panel that I am interested in going to, host facilitated by Dave Camper about being on strike with workers who are currently on strike. Um, there's a federal worker meetup that I'm excited to go to as a federal employee, which is literally just going to be a meetup of federal employees talking about their jobs, talking about how they're organizing, talking about what's not going well in their organizing. And it's 4,000 people that are really, really excited about doing this kind of stuff and really dedicated to this kind of stuff and to the organizing and to each other and to the working class. It's just I'm incredibly, incredibly excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things to bring out what you're talking about, you know, we have a book called Democracy is Power, and that's one of the things we talk about the most is union democracy. And that doesn't just mean getting the right to elect your leader, you know, of your international union, although that's important stuff. It really means having a culture where the worker on the shop floor, on the front line, the worker who lives the job has the knowledge to decide what should happen in their union and in their workplace, right? So Mm -hmm. what we believe is we certainly are glad to have international presidents. We're glad to have local presidents. We're glad to have, you know, people with, with some sort of official positions. But really this conference is all about the knowledge and skill and, uh, you know, inspiration of the member, the, the, Mm -hmm. the rank and file member who we believe as an organization is empowered to make decisions should has has specialized knowledge that should be shared and can find answers to their organizing issues in each other. Don't need to look to an expert necessarily, don't need to look to an official 
leader necessarily just need to get together and have confidence in the idea of democratic unionism where members really do get to decide what happens so that's the spirit of the thing that's why we focus on having members speak about their experience and not necessarily someone who's been on staff for 30 years just because you know they've been trained and paid to do it we believe that rank and file members are the ones who have that that special insight um, and we also believe that's not brought up, you know, enough elsewhere. It's just not what we do in our society. We we don't give Frankie fellow workers control over their destinies, and we don't put them at the front of the room, and we don't listen to them. So that's part of what we try to do at Labor Notes. What are some of the things that you're looking forward to most at the uh, at the convention? Any particular panel or meetup or um, anything like that, that that you're particularly excited about? Oh, man, that's really hard to choose. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. You know, we, we have the conference every two years, and there's sort of exciting, big events that happen every time. We have a lot of important speakers that are exciting. Uh, but the things I really am thinking about are what we do between the conferences. So we have, mm. you know, we've been building a network of shop stewards who have these online trainings every month. I'm really excited to see how many of these shop stewards can show up and get connected to one another and what they're going to build over the next two years between our next meetup. The industry meetups are really exciting to me. We've had a lot of labor notes conferences where you'll have people meet up in a certain industry. And then between the conferences, they say, let's keep talking. Let's keep working with one another. Let's build something that can move our union. So I'm really excited to see, you know, it's, it's going to be a great weekend, but what it's really all about for me is, what can we, what's going to come out of this? What seeds are we going to plant that are going to bloom over the next two years and how can we help that happen? Um, so, yeah, I mean, some of the big headline stuff is we're really excited to have Senator Bernie Sanders speaking on Friday night. We're excited to have the president of the Teamster, Sean O'Brien, Sarah Nelson from the flight attendants will be here. Uh, Stacey Davis Gates from the Chicago teachers union, Chris Smalls mm -hmm. from the Amazon labor union, Michelle Eisen from the Starbucks workers. So we really do have a good group of leaders that we're honored to have there. But for me, it really is all about what's going to happen, you know, even just over beers, who's going to connect to one another, what organizations will they form, what fights will they be inspired to keep going over the next two years before we meet again. Some of this stuff is going to be live streamed. I think uh, whatever it is that Bernie Sanders is participating in, and 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 there there's a main session I, I believe every night that's going to be live streamed, and this is going to be airing on Saturday morning, and so uh, some of it will have already happened. Um, where can people watch the live stream live, and then afterwards, will you be able to go back and watch it, even if it's not live? Yeah, I think if you go to our website, labornotes.org, you'll find a sign-up to get the links to the live stream. But you can also just check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, so any social media. You, I think we just started an Instagram account. So if you use social media, we will likely have our stuff uh, shared You know, at the time, uh, at that point. You'll see our schedule. We're live streaming about seven sessions from Friday through the day, Saturday morning and afternoon, and then Sunday afternoon. Uh, and everything from, you know, we'll have speakers on the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and Juneteenth. We'll have Bernie Sanders, of course. We'll have Sarah Nelson talking about strikes. So you can check out our full program. I would recommend people check out our social media. On every platform, we're just labor notes, just how it sounds, L-A-B-O-R-N-O-T-E-S. And you can catch us there. Um, yeah. All right, Jonah, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Really looking forward to uh, getting together with 3,999 of my fellow workers uh, talking about how to, how to make the world better. How many people were at the 2018 convention? It's a good question. Something like 3,000. So if we continue on this trajectory, you know, we're, <laughs> we're going to explode. This was the first year I'm aware of that we had to strictly cap attendance, so... You know, if you know of a venue that can hold 6,000 people in 2024, we should talk. Well, we just in, we just finished building an amphitheater in Huntsville. So. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we need a Huntsville conference. Yeah, <laughs> true. Jonah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for everything you do, and I'm excited to see you this weekend. All right. See you in a bit.
Boomtown Action is a grassroots organization building a multiracial working class movement for racial, gender, economic, and environmental justice in Alabama's rural communities. We stand in solidarity with Alabama workers and are proud to support the Valley Labor Report's efforts to inform and build the Southern Worker Movement. Please visit hometownaction.org and follow our social media channels at Hometown Action to learn more about how you too can get involved to make the South a better place for all workers. Solidarity, y'all. IBW 558 is like a great football team. You've got to have the aptitude, skills, and knowledge to outperform the competition. If you're a non-union electrician, now is the perfect time to get off the sideline and join our team. We have the absolute best wages and benefit package in North Alabama and Southern Tennessee. It's because our team stands together, bargains together, and our families benefit from it. With immediate openings, you have the opportunity to see why the IBW is the right choice. Energy Alabama is a locally operated and membership-based nonprofit organization focused on advancing Alabama's clean energy future through education and advocacy. Many people in charge of infrastructure and building decisions simply don't know about how viable clean and renewable energy is. To that end, Energy Alabama has provided instruction to more than thousands of adults and tens of thousands of K-12 students across the state. We're working hard to build careers in clean energy and help everyday Alabamians save money on their utility bills. Learn more about our work and how you can join us at energyalabama.org. Support for the Valley Labor Report comes from the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers Union. Learn more by visiting www.ifpte.org. The attorneys at Maples, Tucker & Jacobs have stood with the working people of Alabama for over 40 years, providing skilled legal representation for your workplace injury claims. When you are injured on the job, it can be a scary time. The attorneys at Maples, Tucker & Jacobs have the experience to guide you through the process to make sure that you and your family are properly taken care of and your rights are protected. If you need help, call the attorneys at Maples, Tucker & Jacobs at 855-617-9333 or visit online at www.mtnj.com. No representation is made that the quality of legal services provided is greater than the quality of legal services provided by other law firms. Support for this program comes from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 136, out of Central Alabama. Learn more at IBEW136.org. Attention union members, membership organizations, podcasters, or anyone with a payment processing need. The future is here, and your organization needs to be prepared by working with Unionly. With Unionly, your union or organization can take payments on a mobile device, eliminating processing fees, giving you a better price than other payment processing methods, while at the same time supporting a union-friendly business with a specialized skill set to meet your needs. Your members will thank you when they pay their dues at their convenience without waiting in line to deposit cash or check. Start preparing for the future today by calling 206-595-8631 or visiting unionly.io. Come on, you poor workers, good news to you, I'll tell how the good old union has come in here to dwell. Labor creates all wealth. All wealth should go to labor. And you're listening to the Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison, and my co-host is Adam Keller. If you've got anything to add, feel free to give us a call, even though this is a pre-tape. We're recording it. We are not live today. But you can give us a call and leave us a voicemail right now. The phone number is 844-899-TVLR. That is 844-899-8857. We are going to jump right into our interviews with two of my four panelists that I'll be talking to at Labor Notes, at the Labor Notes convention. I am facilitating a panel on organizing the South. Very important thing to do. So we figured, hey, since we're not going to be doing it live, uh, uh, doing the show live, let's talk to some of the panelists that we've got that I have at the Labor Notes Convention. And so that's what we did. And so the next two interviews that you hear is going to be first with Patrick Corte. He is a history and social studies educator in Richmond, Virginia, a member of the Virginia Education Association, the Richmond Education Association, and the Virginia 
caucus of rank and file educators. He talks to us about organizing the union there, about public sector collective bargaining and labor law in Virginia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. After that, we talked to Sakia Royal, a cook for the Department of Health and Human Services in North Carolina. We have a fascinated conversation with her about organizing in the public sector in a state where public selective public sector collective bargaining is banned by people who love freedom. <laughs> <laughs> we talked to her about that uh, after our conversation with Patrick. So first, let's go ahead and jump to that chat with Patrick. All right, we've got Patrick Corte. He is an educator in Virginia, a member of the Virginia Education Association, and VCOR, the Virginia Caucus of Rank-and-File Educators. Patrick, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to take it away on this interview uh, as a former high school history teacher and a former staffer for the Alabama Education Association. Uh, definitely excited to have Patrick on the show. So before we dig into what all is going on in Virginia, just if you don't mind, could you give us a little bit of background? Tell us your story, who you are, what you do, and how you got involved in the labor movement. Sure. Um, I'm a secondary history and social studies teacher here in Virginia. Um, relatively new to teaching, but not new to the labor movement and to community organizing. Um, in terms of how I found myself into the labor movement, I would say um, a few different roads or streams that converge. One is being a worker. <laughs> and sure. Uh, capitalist society and having the experience of working uh, low wage jobs, mostly in the service industry. Um, though I've also worked in agriculture and uh, a few other sectors and, um, you know, across the board, non-union labor. And I come from a family that's uh, very supportive of unions, um, you know, and I have a, picture of my mom on my wall when she was out on strike um as a teacher she was a teacher as well Fantastic. um and so for me it f that was from the 70s for me i always associate <laughs> uh education and labor movement in my mind it's deeply personal in that sense because um you know both my parents um my mom was a, a career teacher my dad taught for um some time and um you know, my mom being involved in her union local and getting it started and um, also being part of a public sector strike um, in the 70s. So that, that's sort of some of the things that come to mind in, in terms of how I found my way to all this stuff. There's other uh, facets to it, I would say, which is, you know, it's the same reason I'm interested in history and social studies as I see a lot of the things happening in our world in terms of the exploitation of the working class by global capitalism of, you know, racial and transphobic and patriarchal oppression that we see in our society. And um, of course the climate crisis um, and wanting to um, be a part of helping to change that. And I think the labor movement is uh, the, the cornerstone of that project. Absolutely. And I appreciate the, the background. You, obviously you get it honestly. Um, and you are, we're, we're two peas in a pod. Uh, a lot of your story really resonates with me. And I got to say, um, I believe that educators make such a difference in, in the way they change lives and, and really shape communities and shape futures. And so where the labor movement and education intersect is such an important part of our society and our economy. So I want to take it from there. If you could tell us a little bit about VCOR, Virginia Caucus of Rank and File Educators, of which you're a member. I'd be happy to. Um, so VCOR, well, you know, our namesake is inspired by um, the Chicago Caucus of Rank and File Educators, um, which is uh, a rank and file caucus inside the Chicago Teachers Union, um, which currently hold leadership. Um, I'd say we're inspired by 
core and, and their experience. But, you know, we're also our own project and dealing with our own situation down here in Virginia and have a different series of challenges and, um, you know, our, our own sort of spin on things. Um, but v um, is a rank and file caucus. Um, some of your listeners may be familiar with this uh, historically, but in, in case they're not, you know, there's a tradition within the labor movement of sort of the most, um, the most progressive segment of the, of the union movement, getting itself organized inside the union in order to change the practice of, of the union organization in a more democratic bottom up fashion that is a uh, more militant and more um, aligned with uh, a, like a politics of liberation, you might say. And this goes back, you know, there's a, of course, many different historical examples of this and present examples, like in the Teamsters, you have the Teamsters for a democratic union. That's sort of an analogous style formation. Um, historically, you had the rank and file group inside the New York teachers union, which was like a, um, a project started by like the communist party in the 1920s inside the teachers union there. And they organized the rank and file group to sort of transform the internal culture of their teachers union. So there's like a whole history of this stuff that, that goes back um, over a hundred years. Um, so that's sort of the tradition that we're working from and building upon. But in terms of what we encountered was, you know, our, our union um, when we started VCOR. Which is um, the Virginia Education Association, right? Uh, an affiliate of the NEA. Yeah. Yeah. So to, I guess to maybe provide some background, um, our state union is the Virginia Education Association. So that's a, 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 its parent union would be the NEA, the National Education Association. And then my local is the REA, the Richmond Education Association. So that's my uh, local union. And you know, when we started this project, um, we first, you know, a, a lot of things were happening. There was the Red for Ed upsurge. Um, there had just been the um, CTU strike in Chicago um, in uh, 2019. And in Virginia, there was a, a group called Virginia Educators United, which was attempting to sort of be part of that statewide upsurge that was happening in um, you know, West Virginia and Oklahoma and to sort of build upon that. So we were in this milieu and these were the things that were happening. And we saw that um, our union had become used to being a very, uh, what we call a business union or a service union, right? right. Um, they might, they, they would lobby for changes in the law. Um, they would provide discounts on different services um, but they weren't really focused on building rank and file workers power in our school buildings um, on the shop floor, so to speak. Right. And that's what we were interested in doing and providing an educational space you know, that could um, get uh, VEA members the skills that they need to feel confident in talking with their colleagues and challenging some of the very unjust and exploitative conditions that we deal with in our in our school buildings. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really uh, inspiring to see that kind of organizing happening in the South, because, you know, like you and, and your sisters and brothers in Virginia, I was also inspired by Chicago and, and the caucus of rank and file educators there, the historic strike in 2012. And and then, of course, as you mentioned, the Red for Ed uh, walkout wave that happened across the country, uh, particularly in, in red states. Uh, so. You know, that's I think that's such a powerful thing that we have rank and file educators in a place like Richmond and a place like Virginia coming together and organizing as some of the more, uh, you know, the militant minority, you might say, uh, the folks who are committed to bringing change and not just happy to go along to get along and maintain the status quo, which I think. Uh, it's easy for for that to happen with established labor organizations. So now that you've told us a little bit about VCOR, uh, one of the things I was interested in, uh, there has been a recent change in Virginia law. And uh, unlike many places in the South, Virginia now has the opportunity for collective bargaining at the school district level. And I was wondering if you could tell us uh, a little bit about that and uh, 
what has happened in Richmond. Sure. Um, I would be happy to give you the rundown on what's changed with collective bargaining and, and maybe even a few notes on sort of um, the strengths and limitations of, sure. of, yeah. of this, right? Um, but, you know, in, in December, actually, let me back that up. On, on May 1st, uh, 2021, uh, which incidentally is International Workers' Day or May Day, right. um, our state legislature reversed the ban or prohibition on public sector collective bargaining, but they didn't provide sweeping legalization. So in other words, it's left up to each uh, you know, municipality and the appropriate governing body to decide whether to allow collective bargaining or not. So while collective bargaining, that is the union negotiation of public sector contracts is no longer illegal, it can only be made legal if you win, for example, in our case, a vote from the school board. So district our union, by district. We, district by district, and this is gonna create you know, a patchwork of union rights throughout the state. And, and I think that's a real drawback of this law, but it is, right. I think, uh, a, a step forward nonetheless. Um, but that just to be upfront and clear about the limitations of this. So um, we, you know, started organizing for this as soon as um, this was announced. Um, and the way that we did it was, you know, we led an authorization card campaign um, going building by building and sort of connected our authorization card campaign to building the union, right? Like really using it, not just, hey, sign the card, um, union, yes or no, but using it as an opportunity to engage our fellow workers about what are the issues you're facing in your job, in your school building, in your work, work site, right? And um, to really bring those together and synthesize them. And then we introduced a resolution to our school board, um, it was like there was back and forth and uh, we did get a watered down resolution compared to the original one that was put forward. Um, but that's the one the school board voted on in an eight to one vote, um, which basically provides um, a, a, a limited bargaining for the first three year contract. So the first round of bargaining um, will be limited to two bargaining issues per party. And then after that first three-year contract expires, uh, it'll go to open bargaining um, on a year-to-year -year annual contract basis. Um, to my knowledge, uh, what constitutes one issue was not defined in the resolution. So mm -hmm. that could create openings in terms of the sure. negotiation yeah. process, um, but that's what it is. And so we won that resolution. And then we went forward, you know, we were well above um, the 30% mark for um, several categories of workers, um, which included, you know, workers on the teacher pay scale, um, safety and security, school nutritional specialists. Um, and so we, those were the categories that went up for, um, that we had, they had the union election for. Um, and we won, um, by like a 99% margin, six wow. workers voted against the union. Um, ever. So um, it's a very, is a, you know, a, a resounding yes uh, to the union. We're still organizing um, with uh, custodial um, and transportation um, staff um, and, and um, office associates as well, like a, um, off, uh, administrative and office associates. So those are the three categories that would be up next for a union election. Um, but, you know, the hope, our hope, both, I, I would say, you know, I can't speak for the REA. I'm just a rank and file member of the REA. But as an REA member and as a member of ECOR, certainly hope that we can build a wall-to-wall -wall union that unites teachers, paraprofessionals, bus drivers, cafeteria staff, custodial workers, you know, as one big union. In the election that y'all had, what would you attribute your success to? Uh, yeah, it's it's a good old fashioned union organizing. No, you know, we we didn't have a slick campaign. It was a very uh, like guerrilla campaign uh, of you know we had we didn't have a lot of staff. 
um, we just built a solid organizing core. Um, like was mentioned uh, earlier, a uh, militant minority, right? We had a solid, um, dedicated core of organizers that were, you know, in the parking lot talking to our colleagues about the union and about collective bargaining rights, um, who were in our work sites, you know, at lunch, in the cafeteria, on lunch duty, you know, uh, in getting any any extra time we could get using those opportunities to talk with our colleagues about um, not just why collective bargaining would be an improvement for our situation, but why we need a union and what type of union we want. And to go, you know, to tie in where VCOR comes into play, we have a vision of a democratic bottom-up member controlled union that's not afraid to fight. And that's not afraid to put forward what we would call a class struggle unionist vision, meaning we see education workers as part of a broader working class struggle and not somehow separate or in some ivory tower disconnected from the struggles of warehouse workers at Amazon, Starbucks workers, you know, right. work in the espresso machine or, you know, work in the counter uh, from UPS workers, you know, whatever, whoever it might be. So that, that, and we really were talking about that and connected it with, you know, this a, a tale of two education unionisms here. And uh, many of us were very inspired by some of the Latin American education workers movements, mm. which saw themselves uh, in a, in a special position as educators, right. With a certain degree of trust, or potential to earn trust in a community. And the question is, do you sort of position yourself outside of your school community as, you know, some savior or crusader, right? Or do you position yourself as a part of that community, right? Part of a, a working class community um, and really being at the service of that community. And so I think the latter is obviously what we trying to advance and, you know, just beginning to, but that's what we were inspired inspired by and um, what we've been trying to mobilize both our colleagues and the broader community around. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, on that note, I'm curious, what has been the reaction from the broader community, from parents, students, um, even the media, perhaps, because uh, we all know that teacher bashing and public sector bashing is is a long media trope. Uh, and I'm just, yeah, I'm curious how has Richmond responded to this successful campaign? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. Like the collect art, we're in an odd spot in that you know our superintendent actually was not against collective bargaining, so that was like a, one factor in play. <laughs> you know, our school board also did vote eight to one in favor of um, collective bargaining, and the one voice of opposition is a school board member who's much more conservative and has been um, unafraid in voicing um, his views on unions, um, sure. which he uh, of classical conservative tropes about how uh, unions will just add you know more bureaucracy to uh, our everyday lives and uh, ruin our public education system and sort of the teacher bashing type stuff. Um, you know, but for the most part, I think, you know, uh, the bigger concern is from the state level, from the Yunkin administration, who certainly have ambitions to, you know, I, I would say privatize our public sector. Um, I don't think they hide that from anyone. And, um, you know, specifically to charterize our public school system, right? And, you um, I'm not an expert on it, but uh, Virginia, I, I know some of the laws on the books do make the implementation of charter schools a uh, slightly more of a challenge in Virginia. I suppose that's a, a good thing, but I have no doubt that uh, there are forces that will work to to try to change that. Um, but, you know, in terms of like students, for example, it's opened a lot of opportunities to uh, have a conversation about like the history of, you know, as a history teacher, too, I'm especially sure. interested in these questions about um, the history of labor unions, um, the division of society into classes, um, and what sort of socioeconomic division means past and present. Um, so it uh, created a teachable moment in our schools and communities, as uh, as educators would say. That's fantastic. And, um, you know, i not surprised to hear in terms of the state response, mm. but, you know, in listening to your story and in listening to 
the success that y'all have had in Richmond, my guess would be that any threats in terms of privatization, uh, expansion of charter schools and other attacks you may face from the state government, I would imagine y'all are a lot better positioned now to fight that off and, and to be, you know, you're better organized now uh, for whatever fights are on the horizon uh, as opposed to maybe a few years ago. Uh, would that be fair? I hope so. What I worry right. about is the massive turnover rate because, yes. you know, there's they've grinded educators down, uh, especially this year. And I mean, obviously, the whole stretch of the pandemic has, has made for a very difficult situation. Um, and that would be obviously an understatement. But uh, I'm seeing so many of my fellow workers be who are demoralized and burned out, even as we you know, have won this victory. And, and I think um, there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement and we've inspired other, you know, now we have other workers in the public sector that are getting organized. And of course, it's part of a bigger wave also in the private sector, right? We, mm-hmm. you know, Richmond had multiple um, Starbucks workers, United campaigns going simultaneously, several um, yes votes happened in Richmond, right? We now have the uh, SEIU campaign for city workers. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of movement. And um, I'm sure that, you know, I, I can say that, you know, our members in the union and in our caucus are, are very proud to have been part of this and to keep that struggle going. But where I worry, you know, and we definitely are in a better place now that we have the right to negotiate our contracts. And, you know, that's the next phase. And that's what I was going to say about the um, limitations of collective bargaining, right? Tale of two bargainings, just like there's a tale of two unions, right? There's uh, unions that are run in a a top-down service model, um, and then there's unions that are run in a democratic, bottom-up, militant fashion. And similarly, there's negotiations that can happen, you know, behind closed doors without member participation, and then there's contract negotiations that can mobilize and, and rally um, educators, you know, in our, our case, educators, but rally, you know, workers to to negotiate their contracts and to set the terms and conditions. And so obviously we hope to assist with the latter, that we want to see mass participation in this process and to use some of the infrastructure that we've built for contract negotiations. So for example, one thing we've done that I'm, I'm very proud of is organize you know, uh, uh, district-wide workers' assemblies that were open to anyone, member or non-member, as a means of sort of modeling what we hope the bargaining process could be like in terms of having groups of workers, you know, putting forward their ideas about what they would like to see their workplaces be like. Because, you know, I I agree with, you know, Joe Burns in his recent book, Class Struggle Unionism. One of the things he says, you know, the biggest mistake of the labor movement is giving up the fight for the shop floor, um, you know, and, and, and we, in, in other words, you know, workers control, right? And, and so that's the type of negotiation process we would like to see is one that emphasizes workers control, which in our case, speaking for teachers, means increasing teacher autonomy, right? Not, and, and not just sticking to, to pay, though we also need to address issues of, of pay and the, the traditional bread and butter issues. But we can't give up the terrain of, you know, control of, the sh- of our shop floor, which means our classrooms and our school buildings. Right, right. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned teacher autonomy and and w- you could you could turn that around. And, and, and because that's something that that's something that teachers, obviously, they want more of. They want less of the, you know, uh, if we could if, if we wanted to slip into a sort of conservative framing here for a second, less of the bureaucrat who doesn't know anything about education telling educators how to educate. Right. And and, you know, I mean, there yeah. are there are certain certain times that that conservatives can get at a problem without understanding why or understanding what their solution is. But um, but, you know, this is something that teachers unions actually do fight for. They fight for teacher autonomy. And 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 yet conservatives are not going to be backing them for this. Um, you know, even the very same conservatives who are going to be on Facebook talking about how we need to, you know, get the government bureaucrats out of our classrooms, but they're not actually going to be supporting teachers as they try to kick some of these government bureaucrats out of their classrooms. Right. They just want to replace government bureaucrats with corporate bureaucrats. Yeah, that's that's right. what they want. And that's, and, you know, and that's, the, that's the rub. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I had one last question for you, which would be uh, to, 
you know, if, if there are any Alabama educators who are listening who may – you know, of course, are going to relate to some of the struggles that you experience and, and your colleagues um, and maybe are, are looking at, hey, Richmond, Virginia, that's that's a little bit more like Alabama than, you know, Chicago and Los Angeles. Uh, do you have any, you know, advice for rank and file educators here in Alabama who are interested in what y'all are doing and would like to make some changes here? Sure. So, you know, VCOR is part of a growing national network called the United Caucuses of Rank and File Educators, and we include caucuses all around the country. Um, you know, West Virginia United Caucus is part of this network. Um, the Chicago Corps is part of this network. Um, the Movement of Rank and File Educators in New York is part of this network. So there's folks all over. Um, and I, I, I'd say get in touch with us. Uh, we'd be happy to walk y'all through um, what we've done and how we did this. Because sometimes we look at the result and not the process behind it. Right. And something I've encountered, and this is maybe the history teacher and me again speaking, right? It's like history is all about, okay, here's the result, but what, what processes are behind it? How did we get here? Right. And people will say, oh, well, Rich, even in our state, oh, well, Richmond's different. Right. Uh, Because Richmond's more seemingly more um, amenable to this. And I think there's some truth to that, but it's also not at all straightforward. There was a lot of opposition that we faced from our fellow workers in some cases, from school board members who wanted to stall this and prevent this, from certain political and economic forces that wanted to undermine this and see this fail for all the reasons that we know. They don't want workers to be organized and have a say in their working and living conditions. But because we got our small group together of people who had a vision and we worked that vision out further um, amongst ourselves, we developed a strategy that was specific to the conditions in our school district and in our school buildings. And we began to develop a story, a narrative, again, that was specific to our situation that resonated with our colleagues. And from there, um, we built it up over time. It didn't happen in a day, a week, or a month. This was a. This took us several years to get to this point. And and also, this is an opportunity to just shout out all the people who came before us. Um, mm. You know, projects. There were other projects like uh, Power People Organizing with Educators in Richmond. There was Virginia Educators United. There were you know other groups mm. that came before us that led to mm. the formation of VCOR and. Um, the struggles we had. So, I, you know, my advice though would be um, find like-minded colleagues, have conversations. You know, we started with reading some articles together about mm. um, what other states and in, in other states, what other unions and union caucuses were doing. And then we eventually were, uh, we were eventually able to form our own caucus. Um, so that's what I'd say. Connect with your colleagues, talk about the issues, um, Read some history if you can, yeah. and um, and and get moving from there. And don't be discouraged that it, you know it will take time to win a majority to your side. And in the South, we have um, a particularly difficult and long struggle ahead. Hmm. Patrick Corte, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Folks, we've been listening to Patrick Corte. He is a, an educator in Richmond, Virginia, a member of the Virginia Education Association and the Virginia Caucus of Rank and File Educators. All right, folks, we are back with Sekia Royal. She is the president of UE, the United Electrical Workers Local 150, representing public and private sector employees in North Carolina. She is a cook for the Department of Health and Human Services of North Carolina. Uh, Sekia, thank you so much for joining the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So let's start off with uh, your your journey to the labor movement. What was it that made you decide to become a union member, to join the union, and and then to become active and and you know uh, be an active participant in your union? Well, um, what first made me decide to join a union is of uh, the 
all the favoritism and um, bullying and retaliation that was going on in my department in my particular um, state hospital that I worked in. Um, we had some supervisors and, and so even directors in the hospital that were participating in retaliation and bullying. And one of our, one of my good coworkers got fired, you know, with, um, based on lies and, you know, them having people write false statements. And so that got me fired up. That got me fired up. Um, they, the UE Local 150 had a rally on the city hall steps to talk about the injustices in, in DHHS, and that was the day I signed up, and that was back in 2015. Gotcha, gotcha. And so you've been a member of UE Local uh, 150 for about seven years. Did you have a history yeah. with, with unions or uh, anything like that before being a member of UE 150? Um, no, I didn't. I really um, can honestly say that I was very green to the to the injustices of the world. You know, you would, mm. when you're constantly working with your head down and not really paying attention, you know, until it happens to you. And so to answer that, no, I was never familiar or had any affiliation with the union until then. None of your, none of your family were, were members? And of, I believe oh. that it was also... I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. No, I was just going to say, no, none of my family members or anything um, were members. The unions were not big in my part. I grew up in a small town, Kansas, mm -hmm. and so unions was not a big talk, you know, um, growing up. So, no, no, it wasn't. Right, right, and and I uh, similarly grew up in a, in a small town, not in Kansas, but in Alabama, and I am only aware of one of my family members who has ever worked in a union, um, worked in a union environment, and um, the rest of my family are, are are generally kind of anti-ish union but this and, and and they're all really conservative for whatever reason um including the guy who's <laughs> who was a member of the teamsters and speaks very highly of being in uh, of unions as, as far as they are good for workers but he hasn't he hasn't quite um you know figured out uh uh that conservative politicians want to uh destroy him <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I, I really believe that it was kind of a good thing that I didn't have any familiar, familiarity with unions um, because of the type of union that we have. Um, we don't have a traditional union. We have a members ran union, so decisions are made from the bottom up. Work is done from the bottom up. We do not have a paid, uh, uh, I guess, um, a staff. person that kind of negotiates union. Yeah, we do have we do have space staff, but we have union um, or um, I guess um, negotiators and things like mm. that. Any work that needs to be done, um, we kind of train up our members and, and they do the leg work, and our and our um, organizer just you know kind of guides us through. Right, right. Talk to us some about uh, about that. How how has it worked for you being in uh, uh, being in in the UE? You know the the UE is is like you said it, it is kind of a, a different union than, than than some. There is certainly much more of a, a an emphasis on on being member run, on being democratic, on not relying so much on on staff. How has your membership and and including yourself uh, responded? to that type of organizing? Um, uh, we have responded, I believe, quite well. Um, you know, it's very intimidating at first, you know, when you come from not having any type of union background and, you know, you're just kind of speaking up on your own behalf. Um, but, you know, UE is really good about training up for the members and, and, and also it has empowered a lot of people um, knowing that they can actually fight their own fight, you know, learning the different steps that it takes and how to, to um, maneuver 
around bosses and, you know, just training people up and giving them the knowledge to fight for themselves has been very empowering. Uh, you, you've mentioned training a couple of times. What are some of the trainings that uh, the UE, that your union, gives its members, that the members give each other? Well, we, um, you know, a lot of our um, a lot of our organizing is, you know, grassroots. We kind of do, um, you know, person-to-person, passing flyers, um, talking to uh, legislators and different things like that. And so, um, I forgot the question, Lord. What what uh, what, what, what are some of the trainings that that y'all uh, okay. give your members? So we just give them basic. Yes, sir. So we just give them basic. Uh, we start off with basic union training. Um, you know the role of the uh, executive board. Um, what it is to be a steward. You know how stewards work and how important they are in the workplace. And, you know, training on gathering information and documentation, different things like that is what the kind of smaller um, training that we start our new members off with. In North Carolina, collective bargaining by public sector employees has been banned since 1959. So y'all are having to organize in an environment where it is illegal to collectively bargain with your employer, um, with with the state, uh, with the municipal governments. What is it like organizing in that environment, keeping membership up and engaged and fighting on fighting on issues without being able to rely on the formal collective bargaining process. Um, it's it's been it's been a, a, a tough fight here in the South. You know, like you could, uh, mentioned, collective bargaining has been banned since 1959. You know, in the Jim Crow era, where you know the South is still traditionally. Uh, a lot of prejudice going on, prejudice is going on, you know, so to speak. And, um, and so it's been, it's, it is, sometimes it's a very hostile environment and we, we encounter a lot of workers that just don't know their basic rights as, you know, as workers, you know, they feel, they know that collective bargaining is illegal or not illegal, but banned. Mm-hmm. You know, there is, it's not illegal, but it's banned. And so with that language being on the books, it's um, very intimidating for some people to speak up or step out because in, re- in fear of retaliation or, you know, they just don't want to be a, have a target from the boss on their back. So it's, it's been kind of hostile, but it's been um, the way we have to organize. It's, like I said, it's very empowering because you have to learn these things for yourself. You have to... Um, kind of get in the trenches and make phone calls and send in emails, you know, kind of. And, like, before we were answered with DHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services is where I work. Um, we don't have collecting bargaining, but we have had meetings and, um, and you know, communication with the DHHS leadership in, North, in Raleigh that, you know, um, we have meet and confer with them every quarter. So even though we don't have a contract to negotiate, they still sit at the table and pretend to listen to our issues and um, and, and, and try and pretend that they're going to try to solve them. So um been kind of tough, you know, and it's really a big need for collective bargaining and organizing unions in the South, you know, just because of the environment. Um, hmm. You know, in the South, traditionally, they have a, a higher amount of black and brown workers. And so um, they're more discriminated against, I would say, than others. Um, like, for instance, North Carolina, we have some of the lowest wages in the country right now um, at minimum wage at seven twenty-five an hour. Mm-hmm. But North Carolina gives the biggest uh, corporate tax breaks to companies moving in, moving their companies into North Carolina. So they gave over $10 billion last year just in tax breaks to some of the bigger corporations like Amazon that has moved in the area.
area in the last year. So, I mean, you know, and, and, and since North Carolina is, is um, exploiting their workers by allowing these companies to come in, um, giving them all this money and yet still and they're paying the sum of the in the country. You know, that's just one of the reasons why um, we feel like collective bargaining is very um, necessary in the South. You know, we have a lot of environmental injustices here in the South as far as, you know, dumping. You know, we have a lot of hog farms and chicken farms here in North Carolina that they, um, the Department of Labor is not uh, forcing them to keep their uh, waste con- contained. You know, um, we had a couple of major hurricanes down here in North Carolina a couple of years back. And we had big issues with the hog pens uh, filling, um, overspilling and environmental issues with that. You know, Duke Energy is one of the biggest dumpers of North Carolina. You know, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say on purpose, but they are not being careful with the environment. And some of them are, have a lot of contaminated water down here because of the dumping of Duke Energy and the hog farms and, you know, um, things like that. Right, right. Uh, and, I don't and, know, there's just a lot... <laughs> No, no, yeah, that's that's totally right. And you mentioned earlier the that the um, the ban on collective bargaining is 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 in some sense a vestige of of Jim Crow and and discrimination. And this is something that that not enough people, certainly outside of the labor movement, very few people outside of the labor movement are aware of this, and not enough people inside of the labor movement are aware of the fact that much a lot of the attacks on labor on organized labor on unions are derivative of attacks on black folks and minorities the right to work was explicitly pushed forward as a racist project um and and i've got this article open from dissent magazine they said that a key driver of the right to work movement beginning in the 30s was texas businessman and white supremacist Vance Muse, who hated unions in part because they promoted the brotherhood of workers across racial lines. Um, and in his advocacy for right to work, he, he said that if right to work was not implemented, then white women and white men will be forced into organizations with, uh, and, you know, forgive me, black African apes whom they will have to call brother or lose their jobs. And this is, you know, I mean, this is the kind of thing that people were saying against unions as they were pushing legislation to try to destroy us. And this is something that Martin Luther King recognized in the uh, during the civil rights movement. He said in an address to the AFL-CIO that the labor hater and the labor baiter is virtually always a twin-headed creature spewing anti-Negro epithets from one mouth and anti-labor propaganda from the other mouth. And this is, you know, that that's an important thing to 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 pull out and 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 to emphasize is is that you know the fight against labor has has always been a fight to divide working people along racial and gender and and any other line that you can imagine other than the dividing line of class. <laughs> that's the one line that they don't want us to understand is that there's a difference between you know our position and our boss's position. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and 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 so you you mentioned um, you know some of the unique ways that you have to conduct your organizing the the unique ways that you have to to advocate for yourself and organize for yourself because you can't collectively bargain and um, and and you have had some success in that you have been able to to win gains for workers in North Carolina in in UE local 150 can you talk to us about some of the things that y'all been able to win for your members Oh, yes. Um, so uh, we can go back as far as 2017. We can start um, 
just there. Uh, so in 2017, you be on $51, uh, $15 minimum wage for state employees. And then the, the following year, you know, of course, they had to um, pay as less people as possible. So they left out part-timers and they left out some other um, people. And so we doubled back on them and we won their $15 an hour as well. Uh, we've won, uh, within the city workers, we've won um, recently in Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte, North Carolina just um, recently won their minimum wage of $20 an hour for city workers. Um, before our campaigns got started, um, they, there were some city workers who were getting paid as low as $12 an hour. Wow. And um, we had, we wanted to 15 a couple of years ago, and then we wanted to 1650 back in 2020. And now we um, have one for the city of Charlotte, minimum wage of $20 an hour for city workers. We've won them... Um, you know, favor in their in their insurance package, you know, getting them to not have to pay a, a premium in some of our cities. During the pandemic, we launched our what we uh, what is the Safe Jobs Save Lives campaign along with the Southern Workers Assembly. And um we were able for our for our DHHS workers, we were able to win um PPE equipment. We were able to win um, hazard pay of time and a half. We were um, able to wait, able to win sick leave of eighty hours due to COVID during that campaign. And in the cities, we were able to get some. It was a different, a different, a difference in between some of the cities. Um, like I believe Greensboro got a five percent COVID pay. Um, we went in different things um, for different cities. You know, we have to launch separate campaigns because they're, you know, they don't all follow the same guidelines. You would think a city worker in Raleigh had the same pay or even or at least the same set of guidelines and rules to go by in the city of Durham. But, you know, all each of their cities run their you know, their city's a different way. So we had to come up with different campaigns for each city. So um, we've been able to, like I said, win hazard pay. We've been able to win a step pay plan in the city of Greensboro and Charlotte um, based on the years of service. So in, when they started working, people started um, giving people the sixteen fifty an hour two years ago, we were able to increase the pay of the workers that had been there um, based on their years of Experience, so that the people coming in the door wasn't making the same amount as the people that had been there for 10 years. And right now we're working on that with this DHHS as well. That's a, I mean, you mentioned that, that at one of those places, the minimum wage was prior $12 an hour, and then they went to, in Charlotte, it was to $20 an hour. That's a big deal to be, I mean, to be able to do that without. Um, w- without the formal process of collective bargaining, which I think really underscores the fact that the that, that unions and collective bargaining are, are not some like a uh, um, it's not one size fits all, and there are ways to get around obstacles that the government or the boss puts in front of you to to be able to win for yourself and 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 the thing that is going to win for you whether or not you've got a a collective bargaining agreement or or anything like that is 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 the organization of your workers how organized are your members how dedicated are they to one another and to the fight and to their community that's going to be the dividing line, it seems to me, between are you going to get a good contract or are you not? Or are you going to, rather, are you going to to win or not? Absolutely. And I just want to point out that that um, increase in Charlotte from 12 to $20 an hour, that happened over several years. I want to say we started our campaign like um, – was back in 2016 and like I said we made small steps 
But for um, I think that for it to go from sixteen fifty an um, hour and up to twenty dollars in in just in these two years, that definitely was a big victory. And 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 how they won that was constantly leafleting workers, getting them aware of you know the issues and getting them talking, going to the city manager's office, demanding meetings, going to city hall with banners and and and, and um, getting on the on the road to speak. And, you know, just playing with the people and the community. And the mm-hmm. community support is one of the biggest things that our union has. That's fantastic. Because, you know, we always say that uh, workers, workers' issues are, you know, the community issues mm-hmm. and vice versa. <laughs> Sakia Royal, uh, that's as good a place as any to end it. Um, I really appreciate your time. I'm going to be talking to Sakia and Patrick Corte on a panel at Labor Notes on organizing the South. Uh, Sakia, I really look forward to meeting you at Labor Notes and talking some more. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm sorry. We kind of got froze. So thank you guys for um, taking your time to listen to you know, what, you know, the issues that we have here in North Carolina and um, organize the South. Yep. Hell that's, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. Y'all have a good evening. You too. Yep, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Energy Alabama supports consumers and is a leader in advocating for them. We have been able to successfully fight off utility rate increases in the state, reduce fees for electric vehicles, increase electric vehicle infrastructure spending, and secured a $100 million refund by Alabama Power after the utility overcharged customers for fuel. To learn more about our work advocating for customers and join the fight, go to energyalabama.org. There's a lot of talk about a shortage of workers, but that's not the case with IBW558. We have provided our customers over 3,000 workers and performed over 3 million man hours in a pandemic year. With 8,000 OJT hours, 900 classroom hours, OSHA 30, and a state license, our members receive the equivalent of a master's degree. That's what makes IBW558 the right choice for your electrical needs. Look us up at Facebook or at IBW558.org. North Alabama DSA is looking for folks to work for a better North Alabama. They prioritize mutual aid, municipal activism, and union solidarity. Contact them on social media or DSA North Alabama at Gmail for more information. Support for this program is provided by the International Association for Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local Lodge 44 in Decatur, Alabama. Learn more at IAMAW44.org. Hometown Action is a grassroots organization building a multiracial working class movement for racial, gender, economic, and environmental justice in Alabama's rural communities. We stand in solidarity with Alabama workers and are proud to support the Valley Labor Report's efforts to inform and build the Southern Worker Movement. Please visit hometownaction.org and follow our social media channels at Hometown Action to learn more about how you too can get involved to make the South a better place for all workers. Solidarity, y'all. Support for this program also comes from the Iron Workers, Local 477. So if you are looking for contractors with lower than average EMR and TRIR, uh, they tell me that if you need to know what those mean, then you will. Uh, or if you need to supplement a workforce at any level for any amount of time, short or long term, if you need iron workers that come trained and certified at no extra cost, or if you need workers from superintendent down to general laborer, and you're looking to start work on a project or you're unhappy with your current contractor situation, you need to call my friend Jeb Miles with the Iron Workers Local 477. They only work with the best in the business, vetted contractors, and can do all kinds of jobs from roofing to steel and bridge erection, from welding to heavy rigging, from structural repairs to machinery alignment, and much more. They supply manpower on four of the five largest projects in North Alabama, so you know they're legit. 
Select. If you need good quality, safe, efficient, diligent, and knowledgeable workers on your job, then you need the Iron Workers Local 477. Call Jeb Miles at 256 383 Three 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 four, or via email at local four seven seven at bellsouth dot net, and make sure you tell them that you heard about them on the Valley Labor Report. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans. And we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers. And we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know we can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE. Dot .org paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees AFL CIO Support for this program also comes from the Mid-South Council of Retail, Wholesale and Department Store Union. Learn more at rwdsu.info. Come on you poor workers, good news to you I'll tell. How the good old union has come in here to dwell. Alabama's only Union Talk Radio Show. This is the Valley Labor Report, and my name is Jacob Morrison, and my co-host is Adam Keller. If you have anything to add, feel free to give us a call. The phone number is 844-899-TVLR. We are not live, so we will not be able to take it, but you can leave a voicemail, and we might take it next week. Uh, We just had a couple of great conversations with some Southern Unionists about organizing in the South. If you missed any of that, any of our conversation with history and social studies educator in Virginia, Patrick Corte, and Department of Health and Human Services cook, Sakia Royal, if you missed any part of that, or our conversation with Jonah Furman about labor notes and the convention, you missed any part of that, you can always go to our YouTube and our Facebook and our podcast feed, and you'll be able to find all of it. You'll be able to find all of it. So don't worry if you miss something. Just find us online, and you'll be able to go back and listen. We've got a chat next with uh, Scott Eric of Unionly about the fight against labor across the United States, in states across the U.S., and uh, the way that, and one way, of course, uh, not the only way, but one way that unions can insulate themselves, insulate themselves, against uh, some attacks by the boss. So let's go ahead and play that. Folks, we have got Scott Herrick on the line, founder and CEO of Union Lee, Teamsters represented Union Lee. Um, and uh, Scott, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you wanted to talk, uh, we, we, we wanted to talk some about some of the laws that have been um, that have been either passed or have been kicked around in state legislatures across the country that are banning dues deduction um, from paychecks of, of workers. And so talk to us about some of those laws and, and how they are affecting unions in, in those states. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the the most aggressive one we've seen is coming out of West Virginia, where it was just banned wholesale. Um, and we've had the pleasure and honor of being able to help the uh, West Virginia Fraternal Order of Police kind of recover from that. But there's been a lot of legislation around teachers specifically. And uh, Florida, Indiana recently kind of made news. In Indiana, some of it passed. Florida, a lot of it is stalled or either dead. But it just seems like there's an increasing number of, of bills that are going through around payroll deduction specifically or making it harder to join a union or making it harder to uh, you know check everything and to me overall the theme is if that's going to increase which it clearly is or even outside of state legislature with the biggest union busting tactic being uh, the cutting of payroll deduction of dues why not get ahead of that and remove the biggest tactic and biggest weapon that uh, employers have against unions and have have individual organizations set up their own dues system so I think to me, as things shift in that direction, uh, you know, 
payroll deduction dues was you know established a long time ago awesome uh, but now as things have changed it seems like it needs to be a change in thought around how that's done where unions can take control of their financial destiny and just get ahead of the curve uh, either you know we, we've helped reactively where they've had their their payroll deduction shut down and they've called and said hey well how what, what do we do and they're kind of scrambling um which we're happy to help with but it's like why not get ahead of the curve and, and just take control of, of finances Right. And didn't uh, wasn't it Kroger that stopped in Texas, stopped payroll, like just stopped giving the union the, the, the deduction from the payroll at some point, like during negotiations, which I'm fairly certain is illegal. But didn't didn't that <laughs> did that happen or am, am I misremembering? It, it sounds familiar. You know, I, I don't know enough details uh, to talk on that. It sounds pretty familiar and not too surprising. Um, I know we've helped a lot of uh, nurses unions through the OPI. OPEIU uh, with that, where they've done similar things and just said, okay, you have, you know, 24 or 48 hours to respond or, um, yeah, Kroger specifically, I, it sounds familiar, uh, but I, I don't know enough on it to, to speak on it, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, we've okay, so this uh, is actually, it looks like, it looks like this happened quite a while ago, uh, December okay. 6, 2020, last week, we notified UFCW Local 455 uh, mm. that with the pay period beginning November 29, we will no longer deduct union dues, initiation <laughs> fees, wow. et cetera, et cetera. Um, Which goes to your point wild. about the power that employers have right. when you're relying on payroll deduction. Right. Because if and you just uh, totally yeah. stop the the flow of funds to a union, you know, I mean, that's that's like a big deal. <laughs> yeah, they're done, right? And it uh, it's it's wild to me too. And it, it uh, actually was talking to a friend of mine who owns a you know very union friendly business here in Seattle, and he was saying, "Well, wait, man, it'd be awesome to work with a system like this to not just say, hey, we want to stop doing it. He's like, we're happy to do it.'" But he's basically, they have a team of like six people that handles only that, right? So they're basically taking the money and then remitting it to the appropriate uh, locals. And he's like, we're happy to do it, but there has to be a better way that costs us less money, which we could then put back into our, our employees. I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting, right? So, I mean, I know that's not necessarily always been part of the conversation where it's just been used as such a weapon. But to me, it overall, it seems like, if the employer doesn't enjoy doing it, it costs them a lot of money and time that could go back to employees. If uh, the employees don't know it's happening or they don't have control of it uh, with either the, the checkoff or the authorization, um, and then uh, the union has the possibility of just being defunded immediately, like why not do something else? <laughs> and now the emergency response type transition you could imagine, I mean, anybody that has to do anything in, in a rushed manner, you could imagine that that, that, that presents some difficulties. <laughs> what, uh, you know, what has been your experience in the sort of emergency transition? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess how to, so I, uh, glass half full, fortunately, throughout my life, I've had a lot of scenarios <laughs> like that where, uh, you know, you can kind of, when you talk to somebody, you can kind of spot something's not right, I guess you could say. And so I've talked to some people who called in and we started talking and you could tell they're pretty frantic and it's like, Hey, what's, what's going on? Um, so you get down to it. And the beauty of that is it's one, it's kind of saying, Hey, we're here for you and on your side and we can do this. in, I mean, 24 hours tops. Right. Um, and I think a lot of times when, you know, there's not as a fear of technology or people just are getting into a system they don't know about, right? Where they're saying, how, you know, how do we, how can we possibly replace this whole thing, you know, in, in, in this period of time? Uh, but really, I mean, we could have everything set up in an hour, right? But um, I like to say 24 hours just because, uh, but that can all happen. We can have work, help with the communications side of it, emailing people with tracking. Um, I think overall, it's uh, it, it actually, uh, years ago was a uh, certified grief counselor uh, through a local hospital hospital here as part of a program I helped with. And so I think that training helped uh, as well of saying, Hey, <laughs> I, you know, you're, you're going through it right now, which I, I get, you know, and I think step one is, is saying, Hey, you, you, know, you want to hear people out always in general, right? Listening is great. I recommend everybody try it out more listening. <laughs> um, you know, shout out to listening. Um, but within that, it's saying, Hey, okay, I, I hear you what's going on. We're on your side, you know, it's sure it's the technology, it's all that. But to me, that's always an element that I pride myself in is saying, Hey, we're, we're on your team and you have people here who actually, you know, care and they're here to help. So. And now you can get the, 
you can get the the system set up in 24 hours, but wh- how long does it? How, how long has it taken the union to actually transition all of their members to to that system uh, in in the mm-hmm. sort of emergency response situa- si- situation? I think the craziest one we saw the fastest was um, uh, in Hawaii. There's a nurses union there where the same day they got the majority of people to make their payment that day. Wow. Um, so, you know, and then over the course of a few days, I think, I think it was a couple of days that they got everybody. I mean, they were on it. They had it rocking. I mean, I think it depends. Right. But um, pretty quickly. And then the, the first few we helped with and, then they went back to negotiations and allowed them to stay together. And they said, Hey, well, good news. We have a new contract, but bad news. We have to turn the system off. And I said, well, why, why did you go? Well, we part of the new contract is payroll deduction. And I said, well, why? And they said, Oh, well, I guess we hadn't thought of that. So I think it's, that's what, this was like two years ago, right. Where I think it's just so ingrained of like, this is what you do. And they said, well, damn, yeah, we'll think about that in the future. <laughs> so that's what kind of put me on to just the overall, like ideology of the whole process, right? And how things are ingrained where it's, I've kind of been, you know, a little uh, sensitive to talk about this until now, right? To really learn kind of the, the process, learn what's going on. And, and, and now that the threat seems greater than ever, it seems like the right time to talk about it, right? To say, hey, why are people doing this? Why not think of something else, right? So right. that's kind of right. the long answer to, to that uh, question. Um, but basically then those people we helped with, then they said, okay, well, we don't need the service anymore because we've gone back to payroll deduction. So hopefully they don't get put into the same situation uh, a few years down the road. But I mean, you know, uh, fool me, fool me once, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, and the, you know, that's pretty amazing that they were able to do that in, in such a short period of time. But I imagine for them, that was a very stressful short period of time. And, you know, there you can have a much more, you know, a much more leisurely, um, calm uh, <laughs> transition if you're not yeah. literally worried about funding your entire operation um, mm-hmm. at, yeah. in, you know. And, and I think <laughs> the great thing uh, to echo a point you made earlier is knowing if if they're working with you guys at Union Lee, that y'all will be advocates for them. It's more than just uh, you know numbers on a spreadsheet. You're really mm-hmm. there to support the union through the transition yep. and make it yep. you know as seamless as possible so that they can continue to do the work for their membership. You got it. Yep. No, it's uh, that's. And I like to say that I like to say, you know, talk is cheap, right? Anybody can just say that, but uh, ask anybody we work with, right? I take great pride in that, right? Where if I'm going to say something, uh, you know, better believe I'm going to back it up. So, um, you know, and that's, that's really why we do this. And, you know, if you're going to do anything, you know, if, if you can make an impact and really help people, that's, that's what we're trying to do. So. Absolutely. And and y'all are helping uh, y'all are helping several unions uh, across the U.S. Can can you tell us again? I, I know that you did last time, but ha- how many unions and and uh, membership based organizations are y'all working with right now? Uh, it's getting it's close to close to five hundred uh, individual locals around the country, um, wow. ranging from you know forty members to fifty thousand members individually. So. Um, yeah, we you know, anybody wow. we take take all comers, right? So um, it's uh, I think it's it's like anything. It's a it's a trust play, right? Mm-hmm. Where you know we first start out, people are like, hey, who who is this guy? Why should we talk to them? Um, sure, but I think as we've you know words gotten out, it's like oh, they actually are here to help us, and um, we've been fortunate to have the you know success and work with the people we do. But obviously, there's there's more to help with. So, do you have any estimate yeah. on the number of union members that? that pay dues through unionly? Um, I could get back to you on that. It's not, not necessarily it, right now. I mean, we could look at the overall transactions, but it's, I want to say it's around uh, three to 400,000. Uh, maybe that might be high. That might be a little bit high, but it's, it's over, over a hundred thousand I'd say. So um, that's fantastic. One, two, three yeah. hundred thousand or so union members across 400 <laughs> locals. Um, uh, uh, across almost 500 locals, you said across almost 500 mm-hmm. locals. That's pretty impressive. Um, that's pretty impressive, and I think you know the the that 
you know, being able to service that many people um, and and them continuing to stay with y'all, uh, I, I think, you know, that speaks to a certain amount of, of trust and ability to perform. So um, and, and we've we've certainly sure. been happy uh, with, yeah, good. with what we definitely we're appreciate the yeah. work that you do on our behalf. Oh, and Oh, absolutely. It's cool. So I need to get some of the, I need to get some of the merch myself, you know, <laughs> The hat, yeah. You know. Just stay uh, tuned the for the new shirt that's coming. Okay, all right. Yeah, I yeah. like it. I like it. We also one thing to put out too is we we also uh, have a very strict data confidentiality policy, um, mm-hmm. and that we also explicitly state that we do not uh, uh, share, sell, or profit off of data. Right. If if you want to go to the hilarious part of most websites, if the question is, do you uh, uh, sell or profit off off of our data, which is a yes or no question, right? what you'll get usually is like a 16 page, you know, uh, soliloquy on the world of communication and the internet. And it, mm-hmm. it doesn't say no. Right. <laughs> right. And in a question, <laughs> if you're not saying no. So to me, I, I've always thought that's just ridiculous. So I say, we, we say, no, we do not. So perfect. Fantastic. And that's important to folks. And, you know, um, we, everything's confidential. We don't, uh, share, sell our profit off information as well. So, um, we're, we really mean what we're doing, you know. Scott Herrick, founder and CEO of Teamsters, represented unionly. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Yep. All right, folks, that is going to be it for us on the radio today. But just a reminder... Leave us a voicemail, 844-899-TVLR. That is 844-899-8857. If you've got anything to add to the program, give us your bad boss story, organizing wins, questions, topic suggestions, anything like that. All can go in our voicemail box. You can buy our hat or give us money on our website, tvlr.fm. But find us online. We have got a, we've got two overtimes. We've got double overtime. We went crazy we went crazy this week and we recorded two overtimes first <clears throat> first we talked to chris townsend about the importance of william z foster and his writings what they meant for workers then and what they mean for workers now fascinating conversation really loved it and then <clears throat> a more topical relevant conversation but no less, uh, uh, certainly no less important, but uh, a, a, a more topical conversation. Uh, we talked to Ashley Little, research assistant. <clears throat> Ashley Little, research assistant at the Guttmacher Institute with the Guttmacher Employees United about their organizing efforts and about the, frankly, uh, smear against them in The Intercept last week by Ryan Grimm. Very disappointing article, but we're going to be talking about, we're going to be doing both of those things in overtime, so find us online. All power to the workers. All right, folks. All right. We got rid of those folks on the radio. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for staying with us. We've got a great overtime lined up for you. You can still call in. The phone number is 844-899-TVLR and leave us a voicemail. We're still not live, but you can leave us a voicemail. We're going to take a short break and we will be right back with Chris Townsend.
So our guest for overtime this week is Chris Townsend. Chris Townsend is a former national staffer for the United Electrical Workers, um, also recently retired from his gig at the ATU as National Director of Organizing. Chris, thank you so much for talking to us. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So we wanted to talk to him because he is the there. There has really been a resurgence in interest around the writing of William Z. Foster. William Z. Foster was a union organizer in the 20th century, extremely successful, um, and he has particularly there's been there's been a particular resurgence in interest around him following the win at the Staten Island Amazon warehouse by the Amazon Labor Union because Justine Medina mentioned that a cadre of the organizers there um, read a lot uh, a collective uh, a collected writings of William Z. Foster and so I wanted to talk to somebody who knew a little bit about William Z. Foster, and I asked around, and uh, and, and this guy's name kept coming up, Chris Townsend, um, partially because he was um, almost single-handedly responsible for getting <laughs> for getting Foster's writing back into print. Um, so you know, I think great guest to have. Before we dig in, before we dig into um, William Z. Foster, can you uh, you know, I- if you would introduce yourself and, and talk to us some about your journey in the late like what got what kind of got you into the labor movement what m- made it so that you know you spent 29 years with ue you spent some time as a member of the atu before that and then you spent nine years as director of organizing for the atu right so this is something that you've really devoted your life to why is that yeah thank you uh jake and thank you uh adam uh for having me yeah chris townsend uh I I always say, you know, I I think I am more reflective of union organizers than than you might think. But but you wouldn't have anything to measure that against because you may never have met another union organizer. We're invisible uh, and that has its good and its bad. But we are invisible for a variety of reasons. Now, William Z. Foster was not invisible. He was nationally, internationally known. So in any case, in my case, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Um. perfectly ordinary working class kid and uh, took on a left wing political bent when I was a teenager of uh, shortwave radio and just reading and paying attention, watching the state of the country at that time and uh, and didn't go to college. There was no college uh, in my future. So I went to work and thank goodness when I went to work, I had had some understanding of the politics and some understanding of the labor movement. And it came in significant measure because of the book, uh, American trade unionism. I'll give it a plug here. You'll, you'll never miss it. It has this photo on the front, William Z. Foster's American trade unionism principles, organization, strategy, and tactics by uh, international publishers, international publishers. But in any case, I, as a young left winger, I went to a meeting, probably one of the first, actual left-wing meetings in the late 70s, 1979, actually, that I'd gone to. And this book was circulating there. And it was really a meeting primarily of students and college activists and campus uh, socialists and whatnot. But I, uh, being a young worker, someone who was right at that point going from high school to work, I didn't know where I was going at the time. But I saw that book and I thought, man, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll check this out. Well, It sounds a bit like a cliche, but my life was significantly changed for the better because of Foster's book, because it gave me an introduction to, you know, the history, the labor movement. It's good, bad and ugly that comes along with it. And of course, the employers and the state government forces and federal government forces that play a role on this. And then some overall glue of political ideology that got, you know, guided him. And I became just completely taken with that book. Foster wrote uh, probably a dozen books in his career, Misleaders of Labor, uh, American Trade Unionism was a collection of his works, uh, Pages from a Worker's Life, which is just little vignettes from his life. So I sought those out over a couple of years, and I, I just saw myself as in fundamental agreement with him. And, uh, you know, he he went through somewhat of an evolution of his career, you know, as a worker 
and then as a trade union uh, functionary and a labor leader. And, and I guess I have two, but anyway, that that's kind of in a nutshell. I spent, uh, you know, a number of years in ATU as a rank and file member shortly after that meeting that I referenced, I, I went to Florida. That meeting was in Pennsylvania, but I went to Florida and fell into a local organizing drive of the amalgamated transit union and certainly put the foster knowledge to work. The old guys that ran my local at that time were all somewhat devotees of foster, which was almost lucky uh, that that was the case. But then um, I left when I met my wife, returned, came up North again, and I belonged to a couple of different unions. And then I joined UE, the United Electrical Workers or UE, a fairly well-known union for folks who spend some time looking at the labor movement. And I went on and become a staff member. And I was, among other things, I was an international representative. Then I was the political director for 20 years until I retired. And I only retired when I did in 2013 because I had a chance to return to ATU, but uh, to return at the time I did as an international organizing director. And it was a remarkable thing in a lot of ways. It was painful for me to leave UE, but sometimes, you know, the ring comes along and you grab it. And I don't regret it, but when I grabbed it, I went back to ATU, and it was remarkable for a lot of reasons, including it was like nothing had changed since I had been in ATU 35, 38 years before. Uh, The organizing department almost didn't exist. There was no campaign department. There was no education department. There was no collective bargaining department. There was no international relay. I mean, all these things that I sort of thought that a big, large, modern union might have didn't exist. So my job became setting up two departments, new organizing, uh, really restarting that, and then setting up the field mobilization, you know, to give the union some capacity to fight back and campaign when needed. Uh, I did that. And uh, at the end of that eight years and some months, I retired here just recently. And uh, and now I'm devoting myself totally to uh, – you know, revisitation and republishing of Foster's works and any number of other, uh, you know, militant trade union uh, voices that were out there and have gone extinct almost because uh, maybe I'll wind up by saying that, you know, Foster can be found online. Of course, he he wrote a considerable amount over his career. He was he's well known, at least to academics and some uh, unionists like us, but uh I'm unaware of any book that he wrote or any collection of his works. And that, and, and, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a critic of folks trying to really do substantial reading online. I'm unconvinced that uh, folks can really do it. So I think the printed word, the physically printed word is still just much more important for workers. Something you could take to work, read at lunch, take with you, go out and sit up under a tree and read, read on a rainy day. And, and that, capacity. So we've gotten Foster's American trade unionism back into print uh, just a couple of years ago. And it's turned out to be very timely. I didn't know that. I was hoping for that, but I didn't know that, but it's out there and uh, there will be more to follow. Well, that that's fantastic. And, and it sounds like, you know, William Z. Foster was a very, very influential figure um, in your life. And, and, and that's a you know that that's as good a place as any to jump into what American trade unionism contained. Uh, what you mentioned that it was a collected works. Um, what are wh- what are the works specifically in American trade unionism, which is the book by William Z. Foster that has that has kind of taken off as you were able to a, a couple of years ago get it back into print um, and has taken off as, as something that um, particularly younger and militant unionists are reading. Yeah, sure. I'm, I, you know, I sat and I made a list. I'm a list maker. So I made a little list because I sort of know I've been dealing with Foster's works and I never met him. I mean, he died the year I was born, so I never, ever had a chance to meet him. Now, I have met. They're all gone too. any number of longtime trade union and radical functionaries who knew Foster or worked with Foster. I guess I knew a little bit his last secretary, Arthur Zipser, who did a biography of Foster. That's another one of the books that we are going to get back out. So um, I guess I was acquainted with some of his friends and colleagues, but not very many. 
But anyway, I kind of, you know, his whole thematic uh, push as a militant trade unionist, I think it just has become merged with my own thinking. So that's why I sat down. I thought I better I better make a little list. Uh, So I just went through the book and here in brief, here's kind of the, the highlights of what folks may already know about Foster, but should know about Foster if they don't, which was he was the advocate of a concept known as the militant minority meaning that you're never going to get everybody. You, you shouldn't sit at home and bemoan the fact that you can't get everybody to support what you're doing. A militant minority of people are going to move the larger mass and that that can be done and it should be done and it will be done. And it's proof of what we see going on at Starbucks and Amazon, many of the other organizing things, the concept of the militant minority. He had a concept that he used in terms of commanding the militants and the activists to do what he called bore from within. What does that mean? Bore from within, go to the existing unions and try to uh, reform them and push them in an aggressive direction. Don't go out and try to start pure conjured out of thin air, new unions, perfect unions, idealized unions. No bore from within, go to the existing union. That's where the members are. That's where the resources are. See if you can move them forward and do that. Uh, He had a concept that uh, nothing I've seen in 45 years has proven this wrong. The left wing must do the work. Let's get this on the record, uh, guys. Republicans don't organize unions. They would liquidate us. Uh, (laughs) You know, they have done a pretty good job for Democrats, mainstream Democrats, by and large, don't organize unions. These are people that have a whole different political Mm -hmm. orientation. When you get to the left of that, you will begin to find the people who will organize unions, tend to unions, keep them going, you know, use them. So the left wing are, is what must do the work. Foster also was an inveterate oppo- opponent of business union corruption. Any notion that the union would have any other purpose to exist other than to serve the members and serve them aggressively in terms of taking on the employers, taking on the politicians. So he was an inveterate foe of business unionism and all the corruption and problems associated with that. He was a, uh, before it was a popular thing, he was an absolute, uh, almost zealous advocate of industrial unionism, getting away from the old craft model where you had 26 different unions that were trying to organize one workplace. Everybody was going to be in the particular little slice that they were in. He, he saw that this was archaic and impossible, always doomed to failure when the employers turned against it. So he became a, a tremendous advocate of industrial unionism. And he's credited correctly so with having done, because of the decades of the work that he did to promote the whole concept of industrial unionism, he's given appropriate credit for laying a lot of the foundation for what became the Congress of Industrial Organizations in the 1930s. It wouldn't have existed in the form that it did if it hadn't have been for Foster's work with the great packing house organizing campaign uh, during World War I and then at what came after the great steel strike that he organized in 1919. So uh, he, he promulgated a whole notion that these various craft unions should amalgamate, he called, meaning merge together, that they should unify and stop each one pursuing their own tiny little turf and that they should unify and take on the employers as a whole in an amalgamated form. And uh, I think that that's begun to happen in modern times. More and more of these unions will team up and join together. So that was Foster's whole concept of um, amalgamation. He was an advocate for mass campaigns of organizing not piddling away one shop at a time. Nothing wrong with that. We're always gratified when any workers, you know, if a couple people someplace want to join a union, well, let's applaud it. But we need to move the masses of the people. The crisis that we face in the United States and that you guys have always faced in the South is that the number of organized workers is, you know, too few and too uh, sporadically placed to really even depend, you know, defend the territory that they have staked out. So mass campaigns of organization was Foster's mantra. Uh, he was a great advocate of reviving strike struggle, uh, not in a reckless way, not in a 
wild man way, but in a very skilled and planned, uh, thought through methodology. Strike struggle was clearly something that he was able to to uh, perfect that technique. Uh, he was an early advocate amongst many of the unions for an absolute unity of white and black workers. Now, that would be a much more diverse unity that we would have to call for today. But if you think about the United States, it was usually white and black was the dichotomy, even in my time. Uh, at that time, most of the immigrants were white. So it was still a white black unity. But Foster Hood hit this head on to say we had as the white workforce, we had to unify somehow on a trade union basis with the masses of African-American or what they used to refer to as Negro workers, uh, the working class out there in industry after industry, or else we were going to go nowhere uh, without them. Uh, And then the last couple, Foster was a passionate advocate for political independence of the labor movement. Uh, Folks don't know this anymore, but there used to be an entire section of labor leadership that was adhering to the Republican Party. If you can believe this, it seems I mean, the Republican Party today would throw you out if they knew you were a union leader. Uh, but there used to be uh, the Republican Labor Committee. And of course, today that's gone, wiped out. And now we've all been shoveled into the Democratic Party. But the Democratic Party uh, has a very, very uneven record of its support for working people and uh, organized labor. So the Democratic Party and the Republican Party being the two parties nationally that we're allowed to have, and we can back that up. This is a legal monopoly of these two parties, really, in a de facto way. Uh, Foster always argued for independence from that uh, to try to make the kind of progress that neither one of those parties were ever going to deliver for us. And then the last thing, maybe the smaller thing, but it still is germane. Foster was a, a tremendous advocate for what you guys are doing, to have an effective relative labor press He always bemoaned the fact that the newspapers and the magazines and the the very limited publicity that the various unions had to tell their own story and represent uh, these concepts was miserable uh, or non-existent even. So anyway, he he put a great great impetus to what became by the 1930s, a whole revival of labor journalism and labor research and all these things. So, so anyway, that's a a little bit long winded, but I'll touch on that. That's for anyone who does not familiar with Foster. That's an awful lot of his, his uh, concepts and his theories. And that, and, and this is, those were some of the things that were in uh, strategies for organizing in the steel industry, for instance. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I should say anyone that gets hold of that or finds other works of his online or who takes the time and you should buy the book, buy the book uh, and pass it on when you're done with it. But you'll see that those themes that I just ran through there, uh, which is a Mm -hmm. lot to recall, I realize they'll just repeat again and again and again through the decades uh, that because his writings are covered in there from the early teens uh, 19 teens all the way up through uh, the 1950s. And he was consistent with these. I mean, some historical changes and adaptations, but those basic concepts just repeat over and over and over again. And like I said, I, it, the book had such an impact on me because I haven't seen anything in 45 years to change my mind about any of it. Mm-hmm. Right. Looking, and looking I, today at the condition of the working class in the United States, which is pretty, mm-hmm. pretty sad pretty mm-hmm. impoverished. Uh, I'd say that we're in need of a revival of the trade union movement, like nobody's business. Right. Well, I think that, um, you know, so, some of these things that you mentioned here, um, it, it, it also highlights to me the fact that the fact that the people in the Amazon labor union were took so much or, or that, uh, you know, obviously it, like you mentioned the other day, it's not like Chris Smalls necessarily is hanging on every word of William Z. Foster, but there is a, there is an active and 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 relevant part of the leadership that are. Uh, but you know, one of the strategies is, is boring from within as opposed to creating creating new. And the Amazon Labor Union is obviously creating new. And it, maybe it's I, I, I'm not terribly familiar with the internal politics, but I would presume, given their success, that they're not r- particularly like ideologically, you know. Uh, uh, puritanical, we could say. You know, I think that some people in the left can can. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if that if can be an issue, me, if you'd allow me, Jake, I, I know yeah. just you know, I, I know Justine a little. 
Uh, if anybody glances, you know, Facebook being the thing for the older set, you know, if you glance at Facebook, I have a photo of her and me together. I, she was just down here uh, earlier this week. And, uh, you know, we visited on some of this stuff, a lot of other things. I mean, she's one of the core group of the Amazon labor union group that did win that election. Uh, you know, fantastic work that they did. I don't think it's so much that they set out to build a perfect union at all. I think it's just I have a concept that I'm, I'm un, uh, I, I, the more I think it through, the more I'm convinced of it is that what what it really is with the Amazon Labor Union and many of the younger workers today, it's just that they're unconnected to the old guard, the old order of things, or they're disconnected from the old order of things. And they don't have a great deal of connection to it. They don't have a great admiration for it. They don't have any um, tremendous uh, confidence in it. And I think that what the Amazon Labor Union really represented was a group of young militant workers Some of them leftists like Justine, some of them Fosterites that are there, of course, you know, taking advantage of the Internet and the access of all these things. And they just did not seek a bigger union. They didn't see that as the great goal. And I think that that says something about their political thinking, which I think is to be commended in a way. Self-reliance is always, always a a good thing. But I think for the labor leader, well, you know, the AFL-CIO is just opening up its convention right now as we're meeting uh, there in Philadelphia. I mean, you know, this is, I hope, something that's on some of their agenda, even if it's their private agenda. You know, we, we ought to get this on the record, guys. The Amazon Labor Union an independent union started by these workers. It's not an AFL-CIO affiliate. Uh, The Starbucks Workers United, Starbucks, which is another whole multi-thousand movement that's growing and and is going to, frankly, eclipse the Amazon thing, at least in the short term. It is uh, in a union, uh, Workers United, SCIU. It's not affiliated to the AFL. And then my old union, the United Electrical Workers, had a an enormous victory uh, two months ago in Massachusetts with a, right. an election win of 4,000 workers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mm-hmm. It's not an AFL-CIO affiliate. So I don't think that that's a knock on the AFL at all. I think it hopefully is pause for some of the AFL affiliates and their convention, which is made up of their affiliates, to say, hmm, certainly there is organizing going on among some of the AFL mm-hmm. affiliates. But why is it that we've had the biggest wave? I mean, that that little mouthful that I threw out there, that's more than 15,000 people in motion in right. NLRB elections. And, and let's get this on the record, guys. You don't get, you know, I have to remind politicians of this, and sometimes our own, I have to remind people. In this United States, union organizing is an illegal um, act. Now, in Alabama, you guys probably wouldn't need to hear that more than once because you might know it. But anywhere else in the country, it is an illegal act to organize a union. That's why firings are common, terror consultants, anti-union counterattacks from employers, you know, built-in union avoidance systems are, are the norm in corporate America. But to have those three, you know, relatively speaking, gigantic elections all erupt and to find that they were all that what, what's the common denominator of them? They're all led by young militants, and some of them leftists and some of them followers of William Z. Foster, all in all three. And I, that, how do I know that? I know the leadership of all three of those unions. Right. It's a kind of an odd thing how that developed. But it's also they are. Uh, not affiliated to the AFL, or at least not yet. Maybe they will become at some point in time. There's probably merit to that or whatnot. But anyway, and and they're young. They're they're not guys like me. Uh, I'm not in any of those three. You know, I'm 60 years old, so they don't have guys like me sitting around telling them what to do. They've taken the bull by the one. So it's it's a good thing, but I think it's also you know pause for reflection for the old unions to say, mm. you know, uh, what's happening here, uh, you know, and I think it's a good thing, but by all means, it's, it's a very invigorating thing. Right. Right. I'm interested. I, I, I want to get to what are some of the things that, that he says, because a lot of this list se- to me seems to be um, as, as people who are, ho- who are organizing, what are some of the strategies for, 
moving your union to action, right? Um, presuming you have power or that you can acquire power. I'm interested in, in, in part of, in, in some of what he's, like how he says to acquire that power. What are some of the strategies that he has in American trade unionism for acquiring that power, for bringing people into the movement that are, uh, how, how is it that the militant minority is, uh, how is it that they convince the people around them to follow them, uh, but but before we get to that, really quick, and and, and I just want to have this as as kind of a side conversation because it, it it's something that that struck me and is interesting, but is not terribly relevant. But I want to ask it since it's it's our program. So, um, <laughs> but the the boring from within, and this is something that I've that that always seems to make sense to me. Um, if you're in a union. Um, and you've got an apparatus, and you've got resources, and you've got members um, boring from within, and, and getting a active institution or, or an existing institution to move towards being better, towards being more active, seems to me to, in general, obviously I think different contexts require different things, but as a general rule, I think that makes sense to me. Um, but then uh, the political independence, and, I, and I've always... I've always kind of took that attitude as well with electoral politics to the extent that I am at all interested in electoral politics. I came out of trying to kind of, quote unquote, reform the Democratic Party. I tried to do that for a few years as a college student, um, inspired by kind of Bernie Sanders stuff. Uh, I ran for the state executive committee of, of the Democratic Party in Alabama. I was in the College Democrats. You know, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I I just I was totally disillusioned. I was not. And 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 this seems to be a, a better use of my time, frankly. But to the extent that anybody is interested in electoral organizing, um, it seems to me that boring from within makes a certain amount of sense because there is a large segment of the working class that seems that that sees the Democratic Party as on their side. And so we could use a militant minority, you know, it, and, and so the, the juxtaposition there of having a view of political independence of labor from Republicans and Democrats advocating that and advocating a boring from within strategy within the labor movement, that seemed interesting to me. So I was wondering if you could speak to that briefly. Sure. Uh, uh, kind of two halves of that. Uh, the boring from within piece. Uh, let's get some things on the record here. The, the labor movement in the United States, when taken collectively, is the most financially wealthy labor movement in the history of the universe uh, of all time. There isn't a labor movement anywhere on earth that has more money piled up, more assets, more property, pays the kinds of salaries that it pays to its leadership, spends the kind of money that it spends on the union leadership, the bureaucracies and all these things. It's a fact. There's no reason for anyone to try to talk themselves out of that. But yet, if you looked at this tiny slice of that entire pie that was actually dedicated to organizing brand new members, unorganized workers, bringing them in, it's minuscule in comparison. It's minuscule. Now, you'll have certain unions that spend more and pay more attention to it. And you'll have others that don't do anything. And of course, why is that a problem? It's a problem because you cannot defend the gains you've made when you've got uh, eight or nine percent of the workforce organized and you're drowning in an ocean of unorganized workers all undermining you, you can try, you can swim against the current, you can, you know, you can still do better than the unorganized when you have an organization, but you can't make the kinds of gains that you need to make as a as a trade union movement and as a working class. And the, the fact that the leaderships in most unions, just absolutely refuse to dedicate the kinds of resources and priorities to campaigns, mass campaigns of new organizing is criminal. And this is something that Foster exploded over and over and over again by trying to force the leadership to, you know, to support the various mass campaigns that he had he, and, and had some success. He did in doing it. And uh, in any case, that same struggle goes on today. I, I, you know, look, I mentioned the AFL-CIO convention. We wish them well. They're in Philadelphia. We'll see if it even breaks the surface with the news media. But to me, I'm concerned or maybe I'm um, partial to looking to see what news are they going to have to say, hey, we're going to work with the affiliates to redirect substantial or even massive resources into organizing on a mass scale. I I'm not optimistic that it's going to happen, but I, I can dream about that. So, but then secondarily, you come back to the question of uh, 
political independence, I, I always remind folks that the, there's a, quite a divorce between the trade union world and the political world. Well, what, what does that look like? Politicians at any level, your city council person, your county council, all the way up to the president of the United States, they get elections on a calendar basis. There's an election next week. There will be another one in two or four years. This is the political reality of this country. Now, the other political reality is, is that we have a two-party system that systematically excludes the growth and development of any third parties. Uh, I think folks are aware of that. that. This is what Bernie Sanders faced and every third party that's ever come along. You are by de jure fiat, you know, barred from the ballot and everything else. So let's not go to bed tonight thinking that the quote unquote two party system is something that you find in the Bible. And this is a man, man made creation here. So let's get that on the record. But anyway, talking about elections, Joe Biden will face election in two years and several months, like it or not. But let's get it on the record, folks. Trade union elections in terms of organizing elections, we only get them after we have conducted, you know, an underground campaign to build the network, the militant minority, which is what ultimately in most, if not all, organizing drives, not necessarily leftists, but the folks who say, hey, I'm fed up. We're going to form an organization and we're going to confront the boss. What are we suggesting here? We're suggesting a rebellion. That's what a trade union organizing means. We have a lot of unions try to talk you into, oh, we want to be a union so we can be a partner with the company and everything. Well, look, no worker believes that. Uh, <laughs> some union leaderships might believe that and maybe a few politicians. And It's nonsense. I mean, what you're doing is you're stimulating a rebellion of workers to gain power and push back against the boss. The boss is dictatorship. The workplace in the United States is a dictatorship. Now, again, speaking to you all in Alabama, I don't believe this is going to be any surprise at all. But the workplace in the United States is a damn dictatorship. Uh, And I think it explains an awful lot of why we're having a great difficulty, you know, trying to convince people that they should defend what's left of their political uh, democratic institutions and whatnot. But anyway, uh, you know, none of these politicians, not one, would accept the kinds of electoral conditions for their own race as what we have to live with as union organizers. Think about this. Uh, Would Joe Biden or would Donald Trump or anybody else, would they accept it as a legitimate election when they're when the voters can be press ganged into meetings and be paid to listen to the anti Joe Biden, the anti-Trump, you know, rants of their employment. No, nobody would accept that. That's that's not a not only yeah. getting paid to listen to those rants, but being threatened with a lack yes. of pay if you yes. don't listen to them. That's right. Yeah. If you don't vote for Joe Biden, we're going to fire you. If you don't vote yeah. for Donald Trump, we're going to fire you or we will begin to fire people. Then you'll see mm-hmm. we're not just threatening. The- Sorry. So I always say this and I say no Democrat, no Republican is going to lecture Chris Townsend about what democracy really is or what the meaning of life is, you know, no, this, this is a fundamental reality that, that the parties have to represent. Now, I'll say this, in my 45 years, I think the Republican Party has shed any of its previous uh, wrapping that might have been, in, you know, might have convinced people that they were interested in something that was fair or the condition. No, the Republican Party has unmasked itself as an utterly reactionary uh, vehicle to impoverish people and, and you know, increase mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the imbalance that we already have. That They're clear. So I commend them at least for their honesty. But the Democratic Party is more conflicted. It's a bigger mm-hmm. tent. And you've got folks wringing their hands who want to have it both ways. You know, they want to have the they want to have the rain without the thunder You know, all of those Mm -hmm. analogies. And I just look at it and I think, you know, we're headed we're well into a real uh, rough spot here for working people. You know, I'll mention this, which I'm sure this applies uh, in Alabama. I know it applies here to me in Alexandria, Virginia. You know, all you need to know is go back to Bernie Sanders, even if you don't like Bernie Sanders, which is a lot of people. Bernie was the one who publicized the fact, 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 that when he ran for president the first time in 2016, the science uh, indicated that half the working class at that time, 2016, couldn't come up with $500 if it had an emergency. Hmm. Okay, then uh, Brother Sanders decided to run again in 2020, as everyone knows. Now, again, even folks that don't like him 
uh, he brought up uh, an, uh, an amended fact just four years later that at that point, half the working class couldn't come up with four hundred dollars. So I look at folks and say, okay, I don't know what the Democratic Party is waiting for. Are we waiting for absolute impoverishment where we have half the working class that can't come up with a nickel? Hmm. Uh, Then we'll take the kind of swift and dramatic action that's needed to go after, you know, runaway corporate power and corporate dictatorship and all. I don't know. where, Where is that bottom line for them? I don't know. I know I've already reached my bottom line. That's why I'm doing what I can do. As far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, stimulating organized trade union rebellions against all of this is my life's mission until my life runs out. And uh, nothing I've seen in those decades has proven that it's going to happen any other way. Right. Yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's generally the attitude that we take on the show. We uh, spend much more time talking to workers than we do politicians. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. so then let's talk. Good. Let's talk some. I'm sorry. Good. Yeah. I'm yeah. Um, so let's talk some about. Uh, some of the, about those strategies that I was talking about. You know, he advocates for a militant minority and, and kind of recognizing that this is this is an important thing to have, an important thing to strive for. How is it that he proposes that the militant minority gain the trust um, in a you know, and, and presumably in a, in a in a real and not. Um, and not a manufactured way, but actually the 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 rest of of the masses of workers in, in a facility in in a region uh, trust these people um, enough that they are respectful and interested in what the people who we could call the militant minority have to say, and what the people we could call the militant minority advocate for. Um, wh- sure. What are some of the things that that, that he recommends? Yeah, people I, I think that see themselves down. in that, how do how do they talk to their coworkers? Yeah, I think it boils down, Jake, that it's it's a matter of authenticity. Uh, folks join the union all the time for all different reasons. Uh, in a state like yours, they join only because they want to join, uh, except with a few rare exceptions. But in the rest of the country, they may have to join. And I think that One of the really scary exercises that the labor movement is prone never to want to take up, but I suggested for folks is say, how how many members do you have as compared to dues payers? Now, you can say in a state like Alabama that probably the bulk of the folks who are dues payers are also members. Think about the distinction between both somebody who's consciously saying, yeah, this is good for me or good enough for me and I will belong. But you go into the states that are not uh, right to work, where we are able to bargain union shop coverages and whatnot. You know, people are enrolled and there's not necessarily any work done or not enough work done in some cases. Yes. But these folks come in and they contribute. So there's a there's a a danger there in uh, assuming that folks will do this. So anyway, the, the, the authenticity that I referred to is what folks need is that you, you, there's an old adage that I was taught when I was uh, a member and a staff member of the United Electrical Workers. You join the union to get something out of the boss, not to get something out of the union. Think about this. You join the union to get something out of the boss, not to get something out of the union. Now, sadly, when you go into many of these business unions, you see a leadership that essentially has carved out for itself, uh, you know, quite tidy livings, frequently in excess of what the members make, sometimes enormously ahead of where the members make. And you find benefits and perks and whatnot. And look, it's a perk just to work for the union because you don't have to go and be subjected to some foreman, some supervisor, some boss, you know, it, on the workplace, the fact that you're able to do the work and even be out of the workplace, that in and of itself is a perk. But this becomes a divide that can, if unchallenged, uh, develop into a political difference or what would you call it? A, a, a different interest of that leadership in terms of, you know, do they want to rock the boat? Do they, you know, they're, they're comfortable. They're, they're there. They become established. Maybe they've been elected. Maybe they've been appointed, but they then begin to take on a, a, a different interest than what the members have. You know, think of it. You go into any workplace today that has a union, 
I think I'm safe to say that the vast majority of the members would say, I want the union to spend the bulk of its time doing the things that it can do to further our interests. Now, a lot of those members may start by saying my interest, but it's the duty of the union to say, whoa, we're here in this as a collective. So we're doing everything we can do as a union by its nature. It's a collective effort. And most workers that I've ever run into will support that. But when you have a slice of your union leadership that is so highly compensated and and begins to develop a different orientation, they begin to want to hang on to that position because it's better than they could do by going back to the workplace, you know, and and I'll say there's an old adage. It must apply down in your neck of the woods for any of the hunters who are listening here. But there used to be the old adage that said a fat dog won't hunt. Mm hmm. And and when I think of the fat dog, I think of so many of the folks that are, you know, in the sadly in the labor leadership positions. They're they're well in salaries at the higher echelons are indefensibly high. And these folks, you know, they don't you know, uh, uh, someone like us in a grievance situation back in a workplace, a 99 cent grievance, some aggravated. It's inconsequential to these folks. Well, anyway, to come back to Foster, Foster ruthlessly, ruthlessly uh, exposed this. And and actually, you know, in Foster's time, uh, we should say compared to today in Foster's time, there was much more over corruption going on in many of the unions. And Foster was a he wrote an entire book called Misleaders of Labor. And it was a real expose of, you know, certain little entrenched bureaucracies and little, little, uh, you know, dictators that had taken over the unions and were just squeezing them out for their own purposes. So he took that on. An awful lot of that has been cleaned up. I think today it's uh, much less of that, although the employers would make great hay about that, and, you know, would uh, claim that we're all corrupt, which is nonsense. But, but anyway, the authenticity is the, what defines the militant minority, the folks all of us know them. There's maybe most of the listeners here fall in this category. We're the folks that get out of bed in the morning and go to work and do all of our work. And then we, for the boss, and then we do our union work and we do our organizing work and we do all this. We're not getting paid or we're not getting paid very much. And it's thankless many times. And it's, uh, you wonder out loud, you know, how much longer is it going to get worse? I mean, look, I, when I joined up 43 years ago, I joined the first union uh, it's been getting worse every year since I started mm. there, you know, so you have to face that. But I also will hit everybody with the jackpot uh, reality, which is, look, we're not rich enough to give up. You know, uh, giving up is not an option for the working class today. I mean, you, I guess theoretically you can and many people do, but you're just going down the drain into poverty and misery. Uh, the younger generation today, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm 60 years old and I have the great luxury of being able to retire and I have two pensions. Uh, the, the vast majority of the younger cohort out there working today have no pensions. So they're going to work until they drop. Now, when you're 25, 35, 45, that, that seems like a far away <laughs> day in time. But when you get to be my age and you have a bad heart and you're just kind of like, wow, I, I have a few years, I want to do some things. Uh, without it, I'd be working until I dropped. But that is going to be the forecast, unless we can revive uh, a more militant and aggressive labor movement. And again, we're not going to do it through highly paid people and experts and academics Mm. and all these nice, well-intended people who want to offer opinions. No, we're going to do it with regular workers who are authentic, who want to get something out of the boss and not some little privilege for themselves and we'll do it through some really sustained uh, combat with the employers and with the state forces, if need be the government forces, Mm -hmm. that's a fact. They almost invariably defend the employers. Uh, Another lopsided unfairness that we're faced to deal with. But, uh, but anyway, again, Foster's entire themes just echo support for that militant minority that authentically wants to build the labor movement for the good of, the membership strictly and for the good Mm. of the working class more broadly. One of the things that you said Foster advocated, the militant minority advocate, is a, um, 
we could we could say a liberal use of the of the strike tactic um and not not a not a willy nilly not not you know not just a, a haphazard use of it a, a thoughtful and uh, but but and in a use of the strike tactic and and you told me a story yesterday that I thought really int- uh, that really illustrated the value of the strike tactic not just as a um, you know as as a sort of um, idealistic lefties love strikes but as a real material this is how workers win and why it's important to strike so would you care to would you care to tell us that story sure yeah i mean i set the stage for it first though in foster's time his early part of his career pre-national labor relations act so we'd be talking the middle 1930s going back the 50 60 years for the labor movement that existed before then there was an adage. I don't know if Foster was the one that coined it, but there was an adage that said at that time, pre, you know, when there was no governmental structure to organize, the, the mantra was all organizing is to prepare for strike. Because folks may not know this, that prior to any legal governmental structure to allow you to unionize and have some way to get an election, some way to gain recognition, some legal offset so that the employer might actually have to settle a contract. Before that, the only option you had in most cases was to strike. So this was why this is maybe what formed a lot of Foster's more militant Uh, views, which was every quote unquote organizing drive became a discussion with folks about, okay, we're going to build up our forces and then we're going to down tools and we're going to strike and we're going to force this employer to meet our demands. And, uh, you know, an awful lot of the labor relations regimen that we live with today at the NLRB, at the Railway Labor Act for rail and airline and then federal some of the states, only a few of the states have it. Alabama has no such state uh, statute that'll, that provides any structure for people to organize on the public sector side. But anyway, uh, prior to that, organizing was all you had. Now, it, it has been quite an advance for us as a labor movement to get where we're at. Now, so strike struggle here in our context is usually in, in the context of contract bargaining and trying to force, uh, you know, extract demands out of the employer. So uh, I would just say that Foster's constant revisitation of the strike tool and the strike weapon is just to remind us that it's a tool in the toolbox. Uh, It certainly was in his day in a much bigger way, but even today it is. And look, we have to look and say to ourselves, how do we uh, defend what we have? And how do we win the kinds of things that we deserve and we want? And I guess I'll say that the the strike tool, you have, uh, I think it's still going on, a pretty considerable uh, coal mine strike going on down there, the warrior strike with the United Mine Workers. Um, I mean, a desperate struggle, but a necessary struggle and uh, to defend what they have. And, you know, you look at this and you say, you know, in the United States in the last couple of decades, strike struggle as they count it. Uh, You know, the government keeps statistics on all this. It's come to a low ebb. Uh, It's not over. It's not stopped, but it's at a low ebb. And it's also reflective, I think. And you've got to connect this with what Foster was saying about our, our the unwillingness of the labor unions collectively to go out and try to organize I mean, the, the, you know, the reason why the United Mine Workers find themselves in, in part in the jam that they're in down there is that there's a gigantic section of the coal industry that is unorganized, that is not unionized. Uh, you have folks working for much, much less in different places. You have other issues there, too, in the environmental shifts in terms of usage of coal and all this. But, uh, you know, we're, you know, Foster, I'm kind of paraphrasing Foster, but he always talked about how we're never going to be able to achieve the kinds of things that we want to achieve and need to achieve at the bargaining table as long as we have this whole army of unorganized people arrayed against us. Now, most labor leaderships and most people would think that the boss is the enemy, that the boss is the roadblock to that. Well, of course, they are technically in your microcosm. But what is really The roadblock is the fact that we have in this country, you know, 93 percent of the private sector working class is arrayed against us as unorganized tools of the bosses. 
unable to exert any pressure on their employer with one exception. I quit. That's what you have in the United States. Thank goodness to the abolishment of slavery, you're not allowed to quit. So they can quit. And we have people quit by the droves. And now during the pandemic, they call it the great resignation. Well, I'm glad for that. We're not industrial serfs here. We can go. But that's uh, really how people express their ultimate disgust uh, rather than organizing. And I think that that, you know, is where I come from. The fact that we are seeing a mass, you know, uh, walk away, a mass quit is proof that if we would reach out to them, if these unions would seriously sit down and go out and take campaigns of organization, if any of you know anyone who's quit recently, many people would say, I would stay here. I would continue to work here, but I'm not going to do it under these terms. But again, lacking any way to force their employer to make any kinds of concessions, they quit. And all of us have quit jobs because you have to, you know, and I should say this uh, news flash to everybody. You know, at the end of the day, what a trade union is in the United States is it's really just an organizational vehicle that you, if you have it, you have these theoretical chance, at least, to force your boss to start doing things or stop doing things. I've given that speech to many union organizing guys. People, you know, they overthink people. Oh, a union, my God, it's all this, it's that. It's, oh, it's a big decision. It isn't a big decision. You're joining an or you're forming or joining an organization so that you can force your, you know, at least as you're collectively in your workplace to try to force your boss to start doing things or force your boss to stop doing things. And I, I, I don't know, I learned that along the way from somebody, I'm sure, but it sir has stuck and, and rung hole, you know, hole and rung uh, true with me. So anyway, my final thing, Jake, to your question about strike struggle, I think I was telling you about the uh, strike that we had here in Northern Virginia uh, against privatization. Uh, and it was one of the most legendary successes I've ever seen in uh, strike struggle. And I was intimately involved with it. This was a Transit property. When I was at the Amalgamated Transit Union, we organized a bus company up here, a privatized bus company, where the work that they were doing had been taken away from one of our large public sector established locals. And of course, the wage was cut in half and the benefits were eliminated. Of course, privatization is just a scam to, uh, you know, cut wages and eliminate benefits. So we organized these workers, which was difficult, and we struck which was difficult. We struck for 84 de days. But at the end of that strike, not only had we won the strike and won our demands, but we had won the legal reconversion of these workers back to the public payroll where they never should have been privatized from. And those workers today, this was three years ago, those workers today are now on the government payroll. They have real pensions, real health insurance, real holidays. They have the ability to move within a, you know, a 12,000 uh, worker transit system in terms of other opportunities and trains. They're not just stuck in some, you know, retrograde multinational company paying them nothing out here in Lorton, Virginia. I mean, this is a life changing success. Now, that being said, that was life changing for the workers. And I was very proud of the role that I played in that. I'm the one that took the strike vote amongst other things. Uh, I don't believe at all that the leadership of the Amalgamated Transit Union has yet learned the lesson of that strike, because what we needed to do was prove that we could do it. And then we needed to replicate that hundreds of places to get these workers back onto the public payrolls that they never should have been privatized from. Now that I think is a question for the leadership of the union. I just retired from, are they going to see it that way? Are they going to see that this is not just a one time? Wow. Wasn't that amazing what we did there? No, this was not a fluke. This has to become the mission. And actually the uh, now deceased uh, president of ATU, Larry Hanley, that entire struggle in Lorton, Virginia with the Transdev Corporation, where we accomplished that, that was his mission. That was his job. He orchestrated that, said he put me on it. Uh, and uh, he passed away kind of midstream during that. So he never was able to live to see the um, the fruits of his uh, labor. But when we were putting that 
together, we realized that. The, and the reason why we had banked on strike struggle was, is that we just knew that none of the employers involved were ever going to agree to this if we were not on strike. The most dramatic uh, throwing down of the glove. We knew it was going to take that, you know. So, uh, so anyway, the strike tool today, uh, while it is not a foolproof thing, and uh, having been a worker that is on strike or, or have been on strike, you know, personally myself, you know, it's you have to think that through. It's not anything to be taken as a rash act. But uh, but anyway, we could use more of it. Strike struggle today is too few. And the workplaces where it is succeeding and moving people forward, they're too small. So we're not yet getting. Now, last thing I'll say on this, guys, is historically you can do the, the you can, you know, they keep statistics on some of this stuff. One of the greatest triggers of strike struggle historically, going back 120, 150 years, are employer, unilateral employer demands and wage cuts that they put on people. Well, I'm going to sit here and venture a little bit of a production we've had during the pandemic. We've had many uh, unorganized employers throw a little more money out there to attract people. There's some labor market problems and we can't find people and all this. It will be interesting to me to see a couple of years down the road when that labor market situation gets something more back to normal to see if the employers unilaterally take these raises back. I think it's probable that we will see that. And the scenario is developing. Uh, maybe I'll be the first to predict it on your show <laughs> that if we begin to see some significant demands for wage cuts, we will see unorganized workers really rise up and rebel that for whatever reason over history, that is one of the more uh, confident predictors of real labor unrest and strike struggle is when the employer just says, I'm going to cut your pay, take it or leave it. And uh, I hope that it doesn't happen, but I suspect based on what we see shaping up that that is likely anyway. Yes. And I, and that, I think that is a really good illustrative story, but I, but that actually wasn't, you told me a couple of one. That wasn't the, the one that I was thinking of. The one that I was thinking of was the guy that you said was a wobbly, um, oh. who, who, when he was, when he was a wobbly in the twenties that you met, he, his yeah. union went on strike all the time over anything. And he said it was really, you know, he, he didn't like striking all the time, but he was amazed at the power the workers had over yeah, the boss. Yeah, no, and then I, he worked for, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this was, I lived, uh, I, I, as I said earlier in the show, I, I left Pennsylvania as a teenager, went to Florida and fell into an ATU organizing drive. And in any event, I rented a little apartment, whatever I could afford for 140 bucks a month, I think it was. And I had a landlord. So my landlord reminded me one day that he wanted my permission to go into my apartment during the day when I was at work so he could show it like he's going to sell it. And I, I kind of was panicked because I just thought, oh, no, he's going to sell the place and I'll have to move. And I kind of liked it. He was a good landlord. And anyway, uh, I gave him permission. But, you know, I'm a I'm a union man. I'm a militant. I had my left wing material and a, some posters and books. And I thought, well, I'm not going to clean up my apartment. On um, You know, I'm thinking, what am I afraid of here? It's supposed to be a free country. So it's my apartment, for God's sakes. I pay my rent. So I left all my stuff out. Anyway, he, he stops me in the driveway at some point after that. And he says, hey, I didn't know you were one of those guys. And uh, this was 1980, I guess. And I remember thinking, uh-oh, is this good or is this bad? Does he think that, you know, because unions, whatever they are, everybody has a pretty charged opinion about them. And he says, oh, I got to show you something. So he takes me into his apartment on the ground floor. He lived right there. And he had his IWW red card tucked into his family Bible. And then he couldn't be have been happier to tell me the story of how he was a member of the IWW in California, which is where he was from, but then he had retired from the painters union out there. But in his early career, he had been part of the crew that, that was represented by the IWW that was blasting the aqueducts down from wherever the water came from down to Los Angeles. It was essentially a hard rock mining operation to do this. And he just reverentially told these stories of how they controlled the job. That union was, it, it, but remember, this was deadly, dangerous, low-paid work uh, with a really unforgiving boss. And the union reflected it oppositely with the strength and militants that it had. And they used to exert. Now, remember, they were up in the boondocks. 
and uh, mining, and there's no town around. There's no modern way to get around. So they had the boss somewhat outnumbered, and they could strike, and they could do these things. And the boss wasn't able to really resist as much. But anyway, he told these just his eyes shined when he would tell these stories about how they would strike over the smallest things. Uh, but they weren't small to him. And his notion was, if you let the boss have an inch, he's going to take a mile and we're not going to give him the inch. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because he I think this is what I had finished by telling you, Jake, that he he went on to be join the painters union. And he would he, in that conversation, he contrasted the two that even though he thought that the IWW was a little too militant, it performed and it was legit and he had great reverence for it. Now the painters union was a little more kissy, kissy, a little more go along, get along, but he did get a pension out of it and whatnot. So there was good and bad on a bad on both of that. But yeah, he, uh, that was the story of uh, how they went on strike one day because the lunch didn't include a pickle and that the union delegate always went to meet with the chuck wagon cook every morning to review the menu and think about it. There was nowhere to go. There was no way to buy anything up in this boonie. So if you didn't, if your boss didn't give you a decent three squares doing this work, you were going to, you know, starve. So their thing was no pickle, no work. And, you know, you look at that and some people might make fun of that or think, oh, my, that's a little bit too much. No, screw that. If you're one of those workers out there working for a low wage to begin with, dangerous work. Mm. And then mm-hmm. the, the least you can expect is that the employer would make provisions to, you know, feed you half decent. A pickle doesn't seem like a big deal. So, yeah, the, the strike struggle is uh, can be a magical thing in the right hands. Yeah, Adam, have you? Uh, I, I've been kind of uh, uh, lording him uh, or, or or hogging him. Uh, uh, have you got any any, any qu- anything uh, that you wanted to ask him? Well, I, I think you know I was trying to take some notes here on on the highlights you have from Foster's work, and the thing that stood out to me is how relevant these debates and these mm-hmm. concepts are, yep. uh, and how really we are engaging in a lot of these same debates now in 2022 that you know foster was writing about decades ago um and and i was just wondering if you just want to take a look at sort of the trends of what we're seeing now with amazon and starbucks as you mentioned uh as well as other campaigns do you think that some of these concepts of foster's the militant minority the political independence boring within do you see is it on the comeback? Uh, would that be fair to say that that there is sure. a section of the labor movement uh, that takes these principles seriously and is gaining traction? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adam, I, I would say absolutely. Is it a world sweeping type thing, tidal wave? No, not yet. But, uh, you know, I uh, did an interview a few weeks ago where I just reviewed the the constantly diminished number of union organizing drives until now. You might have seen the statistics in the news that the number of NLRB elections, which is one of many, many ways to measure the the condition of the, you know, the number of workers in motion to organize. So it, uh, granted, it's only one way to do it, but it's a key one that covers the private sector. And uh, the number of tr- uh, petitions for uh, union elections in all 50 states, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and Guam, whatever the hell. So, no, the, not, whatever the Pacific Mariana Islands, it's covered by the NLRB. The uh, number of elections when I joined up those years ago, decades ago, was about three to five thousand elections per year, covering or- ordinarily thousands to hundreds of thousands of people in the aggregate. The number that I dug up uh, was that uh, 2020, we had 950 some on elections in the United States. Now, there was a pandemic. Let's not in any way minimize that. But it was reflective of a long drop off. 2016, I had looked up the number. It was like 1,475. So it only declined from 1,475 to 950-ish because of the pandemic. So let's not you know, let's be clear. Let's not monkey around with the statistics and try to use them to make our own case. 
But this is a catastrophe. And then the secondary catastrophe within that number is that the number of workplaces uh, that have more than 250 or 500 people in them that will actually have an election in the current thing is you can count on probably two hands and one foot. Uh, because the number, it's not just the number of elections, it's the size of the elections that have been dramatic. Now, what this is reflective of is the mass repression of the employers and the government. I mean, again, this is an illegal thing to try to do this. Oh, everybody will say, no, 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 we're just making our associates aware of their rights. That's baloney. These corporations and the government that makes excuses for them, that protect this dictatorship and this you know, autocracy and whatnot, but in any case, the, the you might have seen just within, I believe, like within the last week, there was a statistic where the number of union elections, let me get this right, the number of NLRB elections have hit 1,000 so far this year. Now, think where we were, 2021. Mm-hmm. The whole thing was 950. Now, we're already at 1,000, and it's only coming to the end of June. And this yeah, was here, here's the statistic like- that you were thinking of. Uh, there, there's a Twitter account called Daily Union Elections, and, and basically every day yeah. they'll screen cap the NLRB filings for the day. Uh, in the tweet, he said, the 1,000th petition for a union certification with the NLRB was filed uh, on May 31st. In 2021, the 1,000th petition wasn't filed until October 4th. The last time we hit 1,000 petitions this early was 2010. Yeah, and and it may not say this here, but I can tell you guys what the punchline is. This is Amazon. No, Mm -hmm. no, hold on. Let me withdraw that. Starbucks. Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, I got the two mixed up. Yeah, this is Starbucks. This is the Starbucks movement, the phenom. There are hundreds. They've already won. I think the number was 140 elections, and there's several hundred more in the works. So wonderful for this, but this goes to show you what one small, relatively speaking, what one small movement can do to kind of, you know, charge start the rest of the labor movement. And I venture to say it will improve. I think there was a part of one of these releases I thought it talked about that it's likely that this year will exceed 2000 for the whole year. I mean, this is wonderful. And, you know, I, I should mention a quick thing in this same vein, uh, and I might have touched on this earlier, stop me, because I've had several interviews where I've gone over the same territory. But anyway, we had Amazon election, which everyone's aware of, the one in Staten Island was over uh, 6,000 people and it succeeded. And we have Amazon, which is a work in progress. It's a bunch of very small employers, but all scraped together. They're well into more than 3,000 people have already successfully organized and another five or 7,000 that are in the pipeline uh, to come. So we're, you know, already at this point, we're more than 10,000. At Starbucks, there's that many people that have won. Yeah, when you you take the aggregate of the people, there's something like, you know, 20 to 40 people in each store. So it takes a lot to get it, but they're already now in excess of the whole Amazon, Amazon being just one location. But then my old union, the United Electrical Workers uh, organized this group of 4,000 at MIT. And, you know, I look at this and I say, here we have uh, three of the most remarkable large campaigns. There will, there hasn't been in the last several years, even three elections that large at all. I, I don't even know. We'd have to sit and find out where they were by the NLRB. Now you'll find some airline elections bigger. You'll find some public sector elections where there may not be any resistance, but we're looking at these three campaigns where they were real knockdown combat with the employers, Amazon spending hundreds of millions of dollars to destroy the union. And they won. And it was Starbucks spending equally gargantuan sums of money to try to kill the union and the people succeed. And MIT, I don't need to tell folks, the MIT is not a pro-union institution. So UE defeated them and organized those 4,000 workers in spite of that. So you look at this and you have to take some some cheer from this and say, you know, let's study this. And I, I think it's worth looking at because there's various reasons why I happen to know the three different groups, but they're all young. Uh, they're all relatively inexperienced. If you were, you know, they're not guys like me. Uh, and they are some leftists and that's broadly defined, you know, there's all different kinds, but you know, folks who are pissed off that they're paid and treated like this and they don't want to quit. 
they're making a stand. They're planting the flag and saying, no, I'm going to make this boss do something. I'm going to demand that they stop doing something here. And you just have to love it. I mean, it's, we haven't seen this in decades and I just have to hope I actually, I sit here some evenings thinking what's number four of a large group like that, because it is exceedingly rare. I'm just hoping it's not a fluke, uh, but uh, but it is a good sign of of things. So I don't, I don't know, Adam, if that kind of got close to what you were looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something you touched on earlier uh, in terms of the great resignation, you're I 100 percent agree with you that that labor uh, and certainly labor leadership should be looking at this as a huge opportunity. Uh, this is, you know, it's a big sign put out there letting us know there's worker discontent. There is there is a energy mm-hmm. among unorganized workers. Right now, that has been the main outlet, is just to quit and to go somewhere else where you're going to get very similar treatment and crappy right. pay and benefits. Or, you know, try your hand at the gig work life uh, and, and all the pitfalls that come with right. that. Uh, so well, I think let, there's, let me, there's demand there. Yeah, yeah. Let me jump in on something. I'll say this. Look, I commend you guys for inviting me to come on. Now, you may not know this, but you might be the only show in Alabama this all year or the whole decade that actually has a real union organizer on to talk about this work, <laughs> what's going on. We are, one of our tags is Alabama's only union talk radio shows. So. <laughs> yeah, that's there right. Uh, but think about it. There aren't very many yeah. of us around. You know what I mean? Even if you were getting up and saying, yeah, we want to find somebody, you know, you, you got to you search around, say, who is it? We're an unknown breed that's out there. Mm-hmm. And then what I the reason why I touch on this is and. I, 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 I am just, uh, I have to bite my tongue when we get to this point in the conversation, you know, anytime there's any kind of news or what passes for news with labor, with organizing, with Amazon, with Starbucks, you know, the, some of the media, what's left of the media will respond and find spokespeople and all this. Well, you almost never find the workers uh, that are speaking up for themselves. That's, that's self, you know, mm-hmm. we would all recognize it because they're just workers. Why would they have an opinion? Even if right. in, like in the case of the Amazon labor union, they just overthrew a regime spending tens of millions of dollars to destroy them. Well, we, they're not, they're not experts. So we don't want to talk to them. So what do they do? They drift or are driven or go back to academics, experts, critics. And then I just turn it off because I say these people, mm-hmm. most of them, not all of them, but most of them have never organized anything. Right. And I'm thinking this is also what ails the labor movement. The labor movement runs around and I mean, you know, they will seek counsel and consultants and studies, you know, about that. we don't need to study anything anymore. We need to go out there and talk to workers and stimulate these rebellions, these mm. trade union uprisings. That's the work that we need to do. That's what I'm doing. That's why I'm involved in some of these things. I'm not, I'm not paid by any of these people. It's just, you, you have to figure out how you can help. Uh, and I'm there, but you know, I, I think that this is maybe, I don't want to dismiss all of these folks because some of them are pro-union. It's always nice when you hear somebody, an academic or a writer or somebody who maybe you do know that they've never organized. They've never organized anything or very much if they have. So you have to applaud it. I don't want to, you know, denounce that. But it's just we don't get the real picture of what's going on out there by not talking to the workers or at least not talking to some of the organizers who are out there. Mm On a, in a hands-on way, dealing with these workers and the and the real condition of the working class, which is deplorable. The, the U.S. working class is in a, 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 a miserable, embar- you know, this is third world conditions in half the workplaces in the United States. It's a fact. Mm-hmm. And uh, anybody wants to sugarcoat that, well, I don't give a damn. That's it's, it's yeah. I know what the facts are. You, and you mentioned, you know, that that news very, very seldomly will actually look to the workers uh, for any kind of story. And uh, last week on our program, we talked about a Scottsboro Starbucks that just filed for a union election. Scottsboro, Alabama, you probably wouldn't know, but it's a very rural, very white, very conservative town. Um, and so it's very meaningful, I think, that the, Starbu- uh, that the Starbucks there is the second in Alabama to file for an election. Uh, it's very cool. And... Also very cool, the local news segment on it, first, 
cool that local news even had a segment on it. That was neat. And then secondly, also cool, is they interviewed one of the baristas, two of the baristas, to talk about it. Um, You know, just normal working people about why they're organizing and about why and 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 they let they gave them the microphone to talk about why they're doing this and why the community should support them why they said union isn't a scary word i mean it was just it was cool as hell you know it was only like three or four minutes but i was like how i I don't know that there's been a better representation of labor on whnt in (laughs) the last five years you know exactly it was exactly. awesome. No, it was and great. you guys should know, and, and listeners should know, you know, one of the, to me, one of the really remarkable things about Amazon and Starbucks and the UE example that I gave at MIT is that they really are run by the workers. There's, mm-hmm. the, you know, UE doesn't have enough paid staff to do all the work. They have to have these folks do it to get the force multiplier. And Amazon, uh, those workers that you've seen in the media, there's a couple of dozen of them. That's what it is. No hide, no guys like me stumbling around cashing their paychecks, helping them, telling them what to do. No, they're doing it on their own. And Amazon is truly that because it's it's also very atomized, you know, for folks who want to join the Starbucks Workers United, they go to the website, they send it in and a volunteer uh, worker, uh, you know, gets back to them. I, I, one of my projects there is to get unemployment compensation for more and more of the fired workers, because then they can work full time. <laughs> on the hotline, you know, taking calls from these baristas calling in from all over mm-hmm. who want to you know, do it. I, 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 I'm driven to do it because I like the idea of, uh, you know, unemployment paying for the organizing. But uh, because we have dozens of workers that have been unfairly illegally fired by the company. But uh, but anyway, yeah, it's remarkable. And and I, now I should say this. I, th- there's always going to be a role for guys like William C. Foster, I suppose. I'm no foster, but I'm a skilled organizer, experienced organizer. Yeah, we have our place, but we're not going to get the mass organizing and the big numbers because there aren't enough of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have to have that multiplier and we have to have, you know, you have to live with the imperfections that that brings and maybe even the setbacks. But again, I I guess I come back to the AFL-CIO and their convention. We'll see. If they come out of the thing with any, I mean, they're, they're going to listen to NGOs and they're going to have college professors and they'll have big, I'm happy for all of it, but I don't know what it does to really get us on the ground in Alabama and begin to organize the, you know, the several millions of unorganized toilers down there. You know, that used to be the operative old word toilers and people don't hear that very often. Well, that's what we've been being reduced to. We're just toilers you know, for a few bucks and get out of here and come back. We'll give you a few bucks tomorrow. I mean, it's just miserable. And I'm pissed off about it. I'm disgusted by it. I think, you know, we have to remind people sometimes that, you know, you, you are a human being. You should live better than this. You know, you should be compensated better than this. Your rights as a human being ought to be respected more than they are. I think big sections of the black community are well aware of that. Now, it's interesting mm-hmm. when you mention, Jake, the white working force down there, this is, you know, again, and what nothing illustrates Foster's point that when the white working class has so systematically failed or refused to reach out and unify with people of color, its own situation is going to go mm-hmm. down the same drain. And it's gratifying when, you, you know, I always say to folks, look, I'm a white guy from Pennsylvania. If you went back to my hometown of Pennsylvania, it's nothing but an ignorant Trump land, but they're living in misery. And they're going down the drain. And I, for one, decided I'm not going to go down the drain. I'm going to unify with these folks, you know, because, you know, we always have uh, lots, plenty of media that wants to accentuate all the things that divide us, you know, color, race, age, sexual orientation or whatever we call it. All these things divide us. Yeah. Uh, immigration status. But we rarely talk about what unites us as working people. And it's that we all have to find a boss to hire us by the hour or salary to pay us. And we sell our labor by the slice. And when we do it like the 93% of the workforce do it, we do it totally on the boss's terms. And we just have to hope that they're going to give us a little extra or something decent or, you know, give us whatever, at least the conditions will bear. But the working class is finally figuring out that you better have some. You better have some power when you go into that kind of a bargain. And uh, that maybe that was the difference when I was that age, why I grabbed onto Foster and I thought, hell yeah, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to join a union because without it, I got nothing. 
Mm. You know, I, as you can see, I wasn't born with great looks, so I'm, <laughs> I never, <laughs> never made a living with any of that. So, uh, but anyway, it's a, it is a good time. It is an interesting time, an adventure, adventurous time in a good way. I got to say, I, I'm feeling hopeful um, in spite of the crises that we face that are so, you know, huge and almost beyond comprehension. I, I'm hopeful uh, when I see rank and file working people who are taking on some of the most powerful corporations in, in the world uh, right here in the heart of the empire. And it's it's yeah. it's very, very gratifying to see that. And I, I'm inspired by it. And I just hope that the inspiration really resonates across the working class, across all of our diversity, uh, because it's the labor movement that helps us advance democracy and justice and solidarity and, and gain the victories that we so deserve. Yeah. yeah. And I really well, uh, appreciate yeah, you, let me, let you've me helped give me inspiration as well today. Yeah, let, let me toss in something. What what can listeners do? Uh, you know, a lot of folks will be listening and say, "Well, it's kind of cool. I agree. Maybe I agree with some or all of that. Great. What can I? What can they do? I'll tell you what they can do. Talk to these young workers. Support them. Mm-hmm. Make a donation to Starbucks Workers United. If anyone goes on to my Facebook today, you'll see that I just had lunch with three different young women: one from Amazon, one from Starbucks, and one from a place you never heard of in Massachusetts. <laughs> and they just happened to be here. But I just spent time with them to encourage them. That's all it was. Mm-hmm. How can I help? How can mm-hmm. I help? What my and I had mentioned the unemployment compensation for the fired Starbucks. I wasn't. I'm not paid to do that. I wasn't designated right. to do that. I saw it as a need and I took it on. Now that maybe seems a little haphazard to do it, but in the aggregate, if more of us who have the skills and knowledge would begin to help encourage these folks, as I have and I will continue to, we will see more of it and uh, all the boats will rise. So, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, th- I mean, there are no shortages. If you if you follow Starbucks Workers United and the Amazon Labor Union on Twitter, um, there are no shortages of workers that have been unjustly fired that you can yeah. donate to GoFundMes for to help sustain them while yeah. uh, they fight the legal battle to get their job back. There's no shortages of stores, especially now with Starbucks right in your community. Um, there there are fewer and fewer places across the country that you're not within an hour of a, a union Starbucks or a unionizing Starbucks. Uh, go swing by there and order a hot drip coffee under the name Union Strong. Show them that you're supporting them. Yeah, exactly. And unionize your workplace. Uh, make your make your union, if you're in a union, more militant. You know, the, the more unions you were talking about, uh, people think that the boss is, 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 the, is the enemy, and, and that's true, but Another enemy, in a certain manner of speaking, is the fact that we've got 93% of the working class unorganized. So the, the, the more we bring that number down, the more helpful it is. So if it, you know, wherever you are, unionizing your workplace, making your union more effective is also, in a roundabout way, helping these people at Starbucks, helping these people at Amazon. It really is. I'll point out, uh, Jake, too, for listeners uh, you you correctly refer to these workers as what they are, which is unorganized. And uh, what I'm about to say, I think folks will realize, is that the media and even unions and even people who should know better customarily refer to these folks as non-union. What, what does that mean? That's ridiculous. There's no basis in any reality. They're unorganized. And the reason why the employers and the media and every and colleges that don't like labor have gone that way is that they don't want to accentuate the fact that people would understand that if you had an organization, you have something. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's just non-union as if it's a, a condition of birth or something. You know, and I, I look at this and I think that as Foster taught us and proved to us that once you have that organization or if you work towards that organization, you better use it. You know, Mm -hmm. another old adage that was taught to me by the old timers way, way back, which was to say, Chris, you don't need to join the union to get something that the boss is going to give you anyway. You join the union to go beyond and above that and to go far beyond that. And, uh, you know, no, you know, nonsense that gets repeated about all unions were too strong and this and that ridiculous, ridiculous. Certainly, even if it did historically ever happen. Certainly isn't the case today. I mean, the, the well, I, I'm not a aware of any period of American history where unions controlled the means of production. So, yeah, exactly. exactly. That's right. <laughs> so it's nonsense. That's right. And and we and and you know, I jump on that right away because nonsense is what pollutes the airwaves mm-hmm. about unions and and myths yes. and nonsense and 
craziness. And, and I, I also applaud the younger generation more and more of them to sort of see through that. And I, I have this construct that uh, you guys might have heard me touch on already. I mean, you know, that the old order of things is discredited media, church, government, even the unions themselves as part of this old order, and that the younger folks seek something new, something different. They may find it, they may have to start it, but that uh, the, the, you know, the folks who have not led very well or misled us or whatnot, they're, they're not going to find a big following unless, unless they resort to hate and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, demagoguery and all the things that we see some folks doing. But if there's going to be any high road, out of this crisis, it's going to be driven by the folks that want to, you know, organize unions and minister to the needs of the working people and stop their abuse and all this, you know. So, but yeah, I, I couldn't be more inspired uh, by all of this. So I just say to folks, find a place that you can help and do it. Hmm. Yep. Let's do it. Absolutely. Uh, Chris Townsend, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You've been really generous with your time and we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And and, uh, thanks to everybody and good luck. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah, we'll see you. All right. Folks, we've been talking to Chris Townsend, for, uh, retired director of organizing at the Amalgamated Transit Union, uh, former staff with the United Electrical Workers. All right, folks. So this is the second overtime. This is our double overtime for this week. And it's a very important a very important conversation that we had with Ashley Little. Um, we wanted to, I, 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 and I'm I'm so thankful for her to taking the time for taking the time to talk to us uh, because I can only imagine how frustrated she is um, about all of this going on. But uh, uh, but we talked to her. Her name is Ashley Little. She is a research assistant at the Guttmacher Institute. Their staff is organizing with Guttmacher. Employees United. They're in the middle of a union election right now, which they will hopefully win despite the smear campaign against them by the union busting law firm Jackson Lewis and The Intercept. <laughs> they will be a part of OPEIU Local 153. And this is our conversation with Ashley. All right, folks. We have got Ashley Little. This is this is a um, this is going to be a, a double overtime. We are going into double overtime here on the Valley Labor Report with Ashley Little, a member of the organizing committee for the Guttmacher Institute, the Guttmacher Workers United, I, I believe, is the name of their union. They are in the middle of a union election right now, and we uh, wanted to go for the first time ever into into double overtime to talk about this because this is we were we were not planning on doing this until this this absolutely freaking ridiculous article came out the other day um <laughs> from Ryan Grimm in the intercept about the the the, the article is titled <clears throat> how uh, elephant in the zoom Meltdowns have brought progressive advocacy groups to a standstill at a critical moment in world history. And the thesis of this piece is basically is basically that um, the staff at progressive nonprofits who make a at, at all of these places, you know, you look at all of these nonprofit unions that are coming up, their starting salaries are something like thirty five. 40,000 a year. The even people that are not just starting out there are not making a whole lot of money. And these are in places like New York and DC. And we have also chronicled over the course of this show, uh, uh, over the course of interviews with workers in the SPLC union with Kayla Blado, current NLRB press secretary, formerly president of the nonprofit union, exploitation that nonprofit workers uniquely face. And the thesis of this article is basically that these workers are big, big, whiny babies who uh, have no conception of what's going on in the world and have no interest in changing the world and are complaining about about really, really, really silly things. And um, 
And it was just so frustrating to me. It was it was incredibly frustrating to me because this is happening in one of the main one of the one of the institutes that they that that the article really focuses in on is the Guttmacher Institute, who, like I said, is in the middle of a union election right now. And the most frustrating thing to me is that over the course of this article, which is an insanely long article. I mean, I don't know. I should have got the word count for this, but it is it is a ridiculously long article. Uh, it took me, I believe, 20 minutes to read the whole thing. Now, I'm not a fast reader, but still, 20 minutes for an article is a really long time. Over the course of this article, they snidely and derisively qu- uh, quote a tweet from a uh, from one of the union's Twitter accounts and do not consult the staff or the leadership of the union. And um, they do not mention the salary disparities between the executive directors who are the ones being quoted for this piece and the staff who are being lambasted by this piece. They do not mention that the Guttmacher Institute has retained Jackson Lewis notorious union-busting law firm. They do not mention any of this. They do not mention any of the real issues that nonprofit workers face, like being like like being exploited for their care of the thing they are working for, which is a pretty uniquely unique thing in a service-based, a care-based role, you know, in, in in a place like a progressive nonprofit or or a nurse or a teacher or something, you can uniquely exploit their desire to serve in the capacity of their profession. And so none of this is mentioned. This is all glossed over in favor of the boss's line, which I mean is you know it's it's something that I, that that I might would say in another, but literally they only Ryan Grimm only quotes bosses. In this piece, and it's in, it's it's infuriating, and so um, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're, we we brought on Ashley Little, and so I I, I set the stage. I, I hope I set it to I, I hope I set it well. Um, and and Ashley, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us during what I can only imagine is an incredibly frustrating time. Um, and, and, and yeah, so just thank you very much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on the pod. So, uh, what else would you, would you add to, to my, to my setting the stage? Is there anything that you think that is important that I missed to, to the, that, that you would want to pull out of the article or that was left out of the article that, you know, what, what else, what else do you think that, that would, would need, the audience would need to have a proper understanding of the stage? Yeah, I think something important to note is, and you probably the audience and you already know and have been thinking about it is um, the road decision that's upcoming um, greatly affects our work, you know, is very directly tied to our work. Um, and how are we going to, you know, deal with this extreme, you know, pressing issue um, without a sustainable and healthy workplace? Yeah, I think that is uh, that's and so what is it that you that 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 the Guttmacher let, let, what is it that the Guttmacher workers are trying to address through unionization? What are some of the things that y'all are looking for that you feel like um, that you feel like would make Guttmacher a place more capable of meeting the moment? Yeah, so um, the Guttmacher Institute is widely known for our um, incredible research on sexual and reproductive health. Um, activists and organizations all over the U.S. and the world use our research. Um, and this unionization effort has been a long time coming. Um, we currently have over 70 percent support from eligible staff members. And the feelings or I guess um what people want out of the unionization effort varies, um, but there are some, you know, similarities for a lot of people, no matter um, what job they have. I think the biggest things for Guttmacher are, like we mentioned before, salary. So having higher salary bands that follow inflation and that are livable for New York and D.C. Um, other things are fair and clear pathways to promotion. 
Um, staff retention is a huge issue. Um, our policy departments, and if you think about Roe, probably one of the most important, you know, this is their moment to um, help shape policy and explain what's going on to people, um, was completely in the past year little down to just a few people out of a team of, I can't say, I, I don't know if I know the entire amount of people on that team, but like 15 ish people, you know, um, so staff retention is a huge thing. Um, and on kind of the opposite ends, um, I think a lot of workers at Guttmacher really enjoy the benefits that we have, the vacation, the sick leave, um, the, uh, maternity and paternity benefits, and we want to keep those benefits and keep them safe through a contract. Right, right, right. And and so, why is it that you think that the executive director at the Guttmacher Institute and executive directors, boards, management across the nonprofit space, uh, of course, maybe maybe there's there seems to be more willingness perhaps in the nonprofit space to accept unionization but but there has been some very very vicious anti-union stuff and 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 when y'all asked for voluntary recognition the Guttmacher Institute uh said okay we will volunteer voluntarily recognize you if you sign a no strike clause as a condition of of recognition which is uh, a no strike and non disparagement and non disparagement i mean just yes. a, just an absurd a silly 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 thing to ask and uh you know why is it that yeah, it doesn't even recognizing the union and going into bargaining doesn't even necessarily mean that y'all are going to get every single thing that you're asking for, which you, you which you you should probably, in, in my view, you know. But it, but even let's let's say just why would they not recognize the union that their workers are? Why would they not respect the people that they hired to make this decision for themselves and respect? the legal process in this country and and the rights inherent that I think workers have or ought to have. Yeah, so I definitely can't know um, what our president, Herminia, Palacio, um, or any of the executive directors think about the unionization effort. But I can think of some ideas of like what executive directors across the repro movement are feeling about this, especially with the article that just came out. Um, I think it's a lot to do with power, um, with sharing power, with allowing workers to have a say in um in what we do with our lives and our work lives. I think a big thing is, you know, we're a reproductive justice, well, more like reproductive rights organization. And repro rights and workers' rights are very similar. You know, it's all about controlling your life, having a choice in what your life looks like. And um, I think with the non disparagement and um, no striking, I think it has a lot to do with wanting to. Um, make our union smaller, make our union less powerful. And that was something that we could not um, give up. Right, right. Of course. I mean, and that's it, it was uh, I mean, yeah, I said earlier it was silly. It's insulting. It's like a slap in the face is what it is. Um, you know, a restriction on speech and a restriction on uh, the the most fundamental weapon that labor has in in negotiations is the withholding of your labor asking you to do those two things as a precondition for recognizing your union is really 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 insulting and and so why then and and we will we'll get to the piece more in a moment or or get to actually the meat of the thing but why do you think in the writing of this piece that grim did not talk to y'all or talk to anybody in the 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 myriad of institutions and the milieu that that he's attacking here. Um, I think it would just be a very very different story. <laughs> um, yeah, that's basically it. Right. Well, so so and then tell us what you think about the about the the 
the thesis of the piece because I'm interested in that because and and this is and 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 I can just say I was talking to Adam before the show. I am somebody as a as a leftist in the South, a leftist unionist in the South. I am somebody that is predisposed to the idea potentially that you know excessive wokeness or insularity or a lack of grace to people that we're working with to people that we're organizing with to 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 other workers i'm sympathetic to the idea that that could be a problem um and and you know uh but uh, the way that he went about making this argument is just insane to me but i'm sympathetic to that as as an issue what are your thoughts about some of the things that it says i mean do you think that there is that there is there is a there there in a certain sense and it just need there it, there needs to be a drastic reshaping of the thing around the workers point of view or are you, would you be of the opinion that that there's simply no there there yeah, um, I guess I agree with you that, you know, I have my own personal qualms about cancel culture, you know, um, in kind of the larger um, space. Um, but I don't think it really applies in the case of workers trying to unionize their workplaces. Um, management has so much power over us. I don't think I could, me as a junior staff member, I don't think I could cancel um you know, higher ups in my organization. Um, and I don't want to. I think the point of unionization is not to cancel or demean or to create divisions. It's to have a proper and clear pathway to communication and um, and working together. I think one part of the article that really struck me um, is um, talking about young people in organizations. Um, in the article... Um, he says that, um, you know, workplaces are becoming more young, more people of color, more women, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I, as a young person um, in the movement, I feel like that's a great thing. Um, right. We are some of the most, you know, all all the identities that I hold um, make me. Um, more susceptible to um, the fall of Roe. You know, abortion rights aren't just something that they affect me on a daily basis. And um, I don't think it's a bad thing to include people who are most affected by these issues in the movement and in Mm Guttmacher. And so, um, you know, I mean, the fact I, I... The fact that that you that you would be be willing to entertain a, a critique of of you know uh, and and the article ma- makes an interesting point about the you know w- I would not I would prefer not to use the right wing framing but the right wing framing of cancel or call out culture or whatever it seems you know when people when you say that people know what you mean or, or kind of generally speaking you know the. It just, I mean, it seems to me that there would be an article to be written about this, uh, at least that includes the perspective of the workers, as opposed to executive directors making 300000 a million dollars a year that are worried about the people that they have the authority to unilaterally hire or fire being upset with them. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, it's just. There's no greater cancellation than the termination of your employment. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, which is what which is what people real. at the Guttmacher Institute, you know, as a as a place with at will employment, you know, I, I'm not speaking to any allegations or, any, or, or or lack thereof of their of their practices with regards to hiring and firing, but as an as an employer that does not have just clause just cause disciplinary procedures in a union contract you are at the mercy of being canceled by your boss for reasons not associated with your with your productivity with your work output and and you know the fact this article doesn't it doesn't contend with any of that there's no there's no grappling with the fact that workers are in in progressive nonprofits and outside of progressive progressive nonprofits are at constant threat of being canceled by their boss. 
Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think there's definitely a, you know, a culture of fear of, you know, of stirring the pot or um, bringing up issues in the workplace. And that's why we want to form a union because doing it by yourself is scary. And it's oftentimes doesn't work um, because of that power difference. And so through a union, it's collectively all of us of Guttmacher Employees United um, coming together to help each other. So um, it, it, in the paragraph above the um, the the one that you mentioned about about workplaces becoming more y- younger and, and more diverse and things like this, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. <laughs> like that shouldn't be controversial. But just just right, to be clear, right. a former executive director said that uh, my last quote, my last nine months, I was spending 90 to 95 percent of my time on internal strife, whereas before that would have been 25 to 30 percent tops. How do you mm. feel about that claim? What do you d- does that? Does does that track in your mind as accurate it, or plausible? <laughs> Do you think it's totally made up? Um, I mean, what what are your thoughts here uh, uh, of that statement? Honestly. Um I don't really know because I don't know what um, my executive directors are doing all the time. I think maybe (laughs) forming a union would help us, you know, have more clear communication about work, Mm. you know, duties and what how we can work together. Right. I mean, common sense dictates that with a collective bargaining agreement in place, with a recognized union in place, with a process uh, for negotiations and for conflict resolution, if hypothetically there is all this internal strife that they're dealing with, what better way to you know navigate that and to come together and actually work through some of those issues than you know with a recognized union because for one thing as employees amongst yourselves as a union of course that gives you the ability to to work amongst each other to resolve any differences y'all may have but uh, you know to the broader point though there's an established avenue for management to sit down with workers to deal with this internal strife that Mm. allegedly they're dealing with so much I find that incredibly hard to believe um, but you know, again, that's, you know, I think it really shows the author who typically, you know, I enjoy a lot of Ryan Grimm's articles, uh, but it shows that he was incredibly out of touch with the perspective of labor and workers and just his whole framework of this piece. Um, and, and I just can't get over that. I can't get over the fact that y'all are doing the right thing here, but our being demonized here and I don't think it's a lot to ask Mm. for nonprofits to practice what they preach right for any I mean for anyone to practice what you preach Um, and I think that's something you know Jacob mentioned earlier we've we've talked with a lot of organizing workers at nonprofits and media institutions and you know other progressive employers and that's often what it boils down to is is that the workers are committed dedicated, passionate. As you said, these issues are not just hypothetical for you. They're real. They're, they're your experience. They're your daily life. And so, you know, it, it is insulting. It really is insulting uh, to take that kind of approach because uh, in my experience and in the conversations we've had with workers such as yourself, uh, I, I am 100% in belief that all of y'all are trying to do the right thing and ultimately make your organization stronger, you know, which is it, it, it's not as adversarial as perhaps this article makes it out to be or as management tends to make it out um, mm-hmm. because obviously you're committed or you wouldn't be there and you wouldn't work as hard as you do uh, and put in the time and, and energy that you do to make to try to fulfill the mission of the institution. 
Yeah, definitely. I think most of us came to Guttmacher um, really excited. I think a lot of people at Guttmacher, this is the place they want to work. This is the place they've always wanted to work. We're all, you know, to do this work, this really difficult work, um, you need to have the passion and you need to have, you know, the want and, you know, yeah, the passion to um, fight for reproductive rights. And, um, and it's like, we're not trying to, we do, we want Guttmacher to thrive. We want Guttmacher to continue on and do the important work that is necessary for our movements. And creating a union doesn't, we're not trying to break down the organization. We're trying to build it up. Right, right. And, y- you know, the, um, I think that uh, that's pretty obvious, um, uh, just in 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 any instance, uh, it, it would seem to me, but especially in progressive nonprofit spaces, uh, that that obviously you want better for yourselves, um, but that you want your your organization to to survive and, and to thrive. Um, but another, but one of the things that the article is basically alleging is that at the expense of that. You are wanting all of these silly things, and so here's here's another quote. I'll uh, I'll throw at you, and 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 I'm. What are like your first thoughts when you hear this? Um, a lot of quote. A lot of staff that work for me that work for me. This is a boss. They ex- <laughs> they expect the organization to be all the things. A movement. Okay, get out the vote. Okay, healing. Okay, take care of you when you're sick. Okay, it's all the things. Can you get your love and healing at home, please? But I can't say that they would crucify me. And I, love and healing seem like the only things there. And and I'm, and look, you correct me if I, are you asking for like hugs on the hour in your union contract? <laughs> Well, when I hear that quote, all I can hear is, you know, wanting sick leave, wanting a non-toxic work environment. wanting That's another way to put it. That's another way to put it, is that you have sick leave. Wow. Take care of you when you're sick. (laughs) Or sick leave is another way to put it. God, holy. Ah, it's insane. I'm sorry. I... (laughs) Yeah, I, I I appreciate that you just can uh, cut right through that because non toxic workplace, that's not an unreasonable demand, right? Uh, that folks be treated with respect and din- dignity, uh, because your working conditions affects the organization's output, and if if folks are being mistreated on the job or discriminated against on the job or not supported just in general ultimately that affects the ability of the organization to fulfill its mission so I mean I think that's and I, I appreciate that you and, and your brothers and sisters on the in the union are continuing to kind of hammer that point home as you said earlier it's not about breaking it down it's about building it up mm-hmm yeah, and I'm sorry I interrupted you a little bit earlier, so you can <laughs> you can finish your thought. <laughs> um, I guess um, the only other thought I had for this specific question is, um, you know, the amazing work that we're doing right now, right before Roe, is set to be. Um, sorry, that's my sink. <laughs> um, set to be um, overturned. You know, the work that, like today, for instance, um, we released um, abortion data right before, you know, Roe is going to be overturned, showing that abortions are increasing in many states and right when Roe is going to be overturned. And you think about, you know, this amazing work that we've been able to do in a toxic org and um, what could we do in a non-toxic org, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the things that that well, if if you could say, what are some of the things that y'all that y'all have had to face that that have made it a difficult place to work? Yeah, I think More it goes back to. Yeah, I think it goes back to what um, kind of the demands that generally we want as a union: um, clear and fair promotions, especially for junior staff who are among the lowest paid in the institutes. Um, 
being able to, I think for, at least from my perspective, I feel like the ladder that was there in the institutes, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is slowly being taken away from junior staff um, during one of the most important times of reproductive rights in the U.S. history. Um, And I think it's also, you know, staff retention has been very difficult. We've been dealing with, you know, low staff, and that's just made our work even harder and, you know, issues even more apparent. Right, right. And and those, I, a clear avenue for promotion, laying out the parameters. This is something that every single union contract deals with, or should deal with, or should least. deal with. This is, I mean, bread and butter. This is not. We're not talking about, you know. I mean, seriously, when you think uh, some of these things that. That it, it's that it is as if you are asking for hugs from your boss every hour on the hour, and and that's simply not the case. Um, and and I you know I can only imagine how you know, I, I, it, like infantilizing that is as somebody as an adult who who works who does the work who makes this organization run who who puts out the information. Yeah, I think that's a big thing for me um, as a young person at Guttmacher is just, yeah, the infantilization um, of our issues, of our wants in the workplace, Um, that this isn't just some um, thing I do after college. Um, This is my job to survive in one of the most expensive cities in the U.S. Um, And... I think in the article it talks about, um, or at least it comes off to me as calling us, you know, whiny babies. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, if if I was a whiny baby, then that would be illegal. Like there's, you know, child labor. So, um, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Um, Ashley, is there anything else that that you feel like is is important for... Um, for our audience and and potentially others who who are listening to this that that don't normally listen to uh, to us, it, it, is there anything else that we haven't gone over yet that that you think it's important for people to know as they are, you know, grappling with this article and and the allegations that it makes from uh, one of the people that it is making allegations against, essentially. Yeah, I think I think a big point of this article is to make unionization seem impossible or scary um, or a detriment to your um, to the movement or your organization or your job. And I think from the support that we've gotten from other workers in the repro space, um, that's simply not true. Um, unionization has. Being a part of the unionization effort at Guttmacher has made me feel more, you know, made me feel more connected with my coworkers, more connected with the movements, more connected with my work, um, and I think has made me a better, um, I'm not going to say like better worker, I guess, because I don't think I was ever a bad worker, but um, I guess just more... Um, I'm able to be my best self to um, to help the movements. Mm-hmm. Ashley Little, um, member of the organizing committee for the Guttmacher Institute, Workers United. Uh, Ashley, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it, and uh, please do let us know if there's anything that we can do to support you. Oh, well, how, how could how could the audience? Is there anything that the audience could do to to support y'all? Yeah, so um, one thing is to follow us on social media. Um, We have both a Twitter and an Instagram. So um, the name is Guttmacher Employees United, um, but the at um, is Gut Union, spelled G-U-T-T-U-N-I-O-N. Just keeping updated with um, where we are in the process towards unionization and um, anything that comes out from it. Um, And yeah. Ashley, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Solidarity.
That's going to wrap up our program for today. Just a reminder, you can support the program, tvlr.fm. You can leave us a voicemail at our phone number, 844-899-TVLR. We are not live this week. We are in Labor Notes at the Labor Notes Convention in Chicago, and we're looking forward to telling you about it next week. All power to the workers. Which side are you on?